Notes. Please take your seats now, and if we could have a little hush, would be much appreciated. <laughs> Merci de prendre place assez rapidement. Nous allons bientôt commencer. Please have a seat. We're going to start soon. I make the. You speak again. Okay. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Please have a little silence before the president arrives, so we can explain the procedures this morning. You say in French. Mesdames, Messieurs, bienvenue. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Please have a seat. Welcome to our Summit of Conscience for the Climate. My name is Isabelle de Goma. I am a journalist from La Croix with Martin Palmer. who will be speaking afterwards. It is our very heavy task to moderate and organize a discussion you will be listening to all day long. So our Summit of Consciences is an initiative of Nicolas Hulot, co-organized by Bayer and ARC, the Alliance for Religion and Environment, the CZU, who is a CZ, sorry, who is welcoming us today, and the R20, which brings together the regions who are mobilizing for the climate. Now, I think today we are definitely going to be living an extraordinary moment. In our secular France, it's really quite unusual to see so many religions brought together, so many spiritual traditions here in such an eminently Republican place as the Economic and Social Council. So you may wonder what all this has to do with the climate. Well, I think it's extremely important. Climate is not simply a question of technicians and politicians and economists. It in fact concerns the way we live on the planet, our way of uh, understanding how we can build together the future, what, what the Pope calls in his encyclical uh, our common home. Now, what is very important also to say, and let me conclude with that, that this summit is not, in fact, a, an end, but rather a beginning. The 40 personalities that you'll be hearing throughout the day, and they represent these consciences. They are in all representing religious and spiritual traditions. And they signed together a document yesterday, and this call will be transmitted to the politicians, to various uh, leaders, and they will all then be negotiating and the COP21 in December. I think uh, currently it's very important because we can see that the COP21 will, might actually end up with a failure. And so this spiritual opening we are attempting to present today is a, t is a way to mobilize, going beyond politics, a way to build this common uh, solution to our planet. This is Martin Palmer. Ooh. And I'm the Secretary General of the Alliance of Religions and Conservation. Our job today is to try and get through a very crowded program, 46 speakers. There will be bells rung when it is time to return. Please return promptly because we have a very crowded agenda. Uh, and we will be starting on time every time that we can. So please listen out. Um, we hope you will enjoy this. It is a simple question which we're asking all of you. Why do I care? And the answer to that is being answered by people all around the world today and will be so right up until the COP in December and beyond. But we are delighted to have you here. Uh, we are expecting uh, the President of France any moment now, so please do settle down. Uh, Isabel and I look forward to a very entertaining time with you, a very mind-stretching time. We hope a fascinating time. Could I ask you please to switch off your mobile phones because it would be slightly embarrassing if you get a phone call in the middle of the President's talk. Thank you very much indeed and welcome. Oh yes, uh, if you are English speaking, it's channel two, French speaking, channel one. We have also translators with our Japanese and with our Brazilian and with our um, Ecuadorian and Chinese guests. They will speak to them uh, and will speak to you in their own language and then into English. So do use this uh, so you can follow what's happening. Thank you very much indeed.
Juste pour nous, nous excuser du, du petit retard, en fait, nous attendons le, le président de la République qui va arriver d'une minute à l'autre. Euh, voilà, donc euh, juste quelques minutes de retard. Merci.
Merci. Merci, cher Nicolas Hulot. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Hulot. Thank you to the President of the French Republic. Thank you also to those who have brought us together today at the Palace of Vienna, headquarters of the Economic, Social, and Environmental Council. It is my honor to be the chairman. I would also like to thank the President of the group uh, Bayard, Monsieur Michel Sabon, as well as the President of the Economic, Social, and Environmental Council. We're all present here in the context of COP21, and everybody knows if we are here together today, it is because something uh, here is, uh, transcends us. The world has a rendezvous with its history. You, the temporal and spiritual leaders of the world, are going to help write this history and not so much in the spirit of domination or some kind of rapport of force, but rather in order to mobilize and to commit, not to defend resources or territory, but rather to defend our soul, our very humanity. So the balance of the world was maintained over the 20th century because of an, the balance of fear of nuclear weapons, but this fragile balance is currently being threatened because capitalism, unregulated capitalism, and the advances of science without any conscience creates a kind of modern slavery whose invisible change, chains are uh, redoubtable. They exclude man in an illusion, which means that for many, it is more a question of what you spend than what you think. And they also exclude mankind in this illusion which destroys his interiority. And in terms of progress as well, technical progress, we increase our quantity and quality of life, but we neglect the quality of life. And we also humanize the machine. And we make turn man into a robot. So this unconcern it fosters uh, passivity among the people, but this has suddenly changed under the scissors of a brutal reality which is linked to human fragility. And uh, f thank you, Mr. President, and f France. And so again, we have a paroxysm of uh, fragility uh, in our planet. And the question which is clearly being asked today is where are we now when it comes to our obligations towards uh, the human being? This is truly the challenge that faces us here. The, f the idea of obligation is also a, of more, not just a question of law. Law is not effective in and of itself, but only through the mandatory nature of that law. This mandatory nature is effective once it is recognized, and it will never lose at this dimension, even if everything is forgotten. But a, a law that is recognized but defended by no one it is nothing. So let's take a look at the right to water, to health to food, to the environment. It is only possible if there is an obligation that we share with regard to human beings who are not able to access these rights, also reducing CO2 emissions and, in, and limiting the rise in temperature to under two degrees is sort of a question of um, putting out the fire but we also have a responsibility to the future generations. We have to save the walls, so to speak. And this, of course, it closes us into a technical material aspect. But saving the human being is to give our action a meaning, a dimension, a spiritual and uh, eternal dimension, depending on our beliefs. This thus involves a single obligation, respect of uh, human beings with an aspiration to, to the good. So the challenge of our century is also the challenge of the other, of uh, otherness and of interiority. Respecting nature is to respect mankind and life, as well as respecting the sea or the sea of the future, or no, sorry, the mother, and also the child that she carries within her and the hopes they have for that child. So what brings us together today is the uh, 
primacy of humankind. What raises us together is to build this common concept of good. Democracy is a legitimate defense of interest, but it is also a question of building a common good. The feeling of being part of the same planetary family where everyone is unique and where we all feel connected by the same collective destiny. But this is, of course, also could be either a tragic or a promising destiny. The peoples need bread, but in addition, they need greatness. And so when I salute Nicolas Hulot, who brought, who brought about this encounter, I would like to thank you, Mr. Kofi Annan and the President of the Republic of Ireland, Mr. Gaines and Prince Albert of Monaco, and Mr. Francois Hollande, the President of the Republic. I would like again to salute your determination and commitment, as well as that of your government and your Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Fabius, and also Mrs. Royal. As for the political success of uh, the COP21, also because you have accepted to open up yet another dimension, that is to say the mobilization of citizens calling upon their conscience. And if diplomats will be negotiating, and if the parliaments ratify the agreement, the key to success will be in the change in the behavior of the citizens of the world guided by their conscience, which is a driver of their commitment. States have no soul, all they have are interests. And I don't believe that there's going to be a sudden emergence of some kind of universal brotherhood and wisdom. But I do think that we can see an idea emerging according to which if we can live, if we are living at the same planet within the same humanity, thus every human being will feel responsible and interdependent with the others, even if they do not like or love each other. So 1945 was the discovery of the unbelievable horror, 2015, the horror is still with us. And here I am thinking, for example, of Daesh. But while these various, uh, uh, the financial situation does not prevent humiliation, men at the top of uh, a powerful structure are completely destroying some of the most, the human soul. And also, the uprooted among us, too, basically have only two behaviors, the inertia, inertia of the soul or also the explosion of violence. So today our commitment, our call upon consciences is not only a question of uh, putting up dikes to prevent the rise of the waters, but also to create an ocean of individual responsibility, which is the only thing that will be capable of extinguishing the future human tempest, only collective responsibility over um, and individual responsibility. So, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to conclude by saying that if social acceptance is a limiting factor for many political decisions, it is going to be the commitment and mobilization of the citizens which will reverse all those barriers and open for us the path towards a new hope. It is this path that we would like to invite you collectively to take with us by signing this call. Thank you very much for your attention. J'appelle à la tribune. Now I'd like to call Mr. Kofi Annan, President of the Elders, President of the Kofi Annan Foundation, and former General Secretary General of the United Nations. Monsieur le Président de la République, <coughs> Votre Altesse, Anne. Mr. President of the Republic, Your Highness, Anna Tuktan Han, Your Holiness, Your Eminence, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. If you allow me, I'll switch to English. Deeply honored to join you today at the Summit of Conscience, which comes just a few months ahead of the UN Climate Summit here in Paris. Allow me, Mr. President, to warmly commend you, as well as His Majesty and the leadership you are, for the leadership you are demonstrating 
on the existential use of our time. The real and present danger of climate change is not anything that we can underestimate. A few months ago, I was greatly blessed by the birth of a third grandchild. His arrival caused me to reflect on the world as I have known it and how it may look by the time he reaches my age. And I'm 77. Of course, today that is considered middle age. <laughs> and it, is, it was a sobering moment. I know, that it is, I know that if action is not taken immediately to stop the, and reverse current climate trends, my grandson will live in a world where the average global temperature could be several degrees higher than when I was a child. The result will be suffocating heat waves, severe droughts, disastrous floods, and devastating wildfires. Entire regions would experience catastrophic decline in food production. Glaciers and ice sheets would disappear, leading to rising sea levels, drowning cities such as New York or Venice and small island states. This brings to mind what Nikita Khrushchev once said when reflecting the impact of potential nuclear war. The living would envy the dead. We are close to reaching the tipping point beyond which man-made climate change risks denying my grandson and his generation of the right to a healthy and sustainable planet. This is not science fiction, but it is not too late to take action. Climate change is a challenge which can and should be confronted. The history of humanity is a story of ingenuity when faced with grave threats. We already have successes and successful stories to inspire us. In the 1980s, when satellite photographs revealed a massive hole in the ozone layer, the nations of the world came together and took a swift and decisive action. Thanks to the adoption of the Montreal Protocol in 18, 1987, which phased out ozone-depleting substances, humanity avoided the worst. We found better ways to power our fridges and air conditioners. We invented aerosols that were less harmful. We used fiscal measures in rich countries and development aid for the poorer ones to help make the transition possible. Scientists now confirm that the giant hole in the world's uh, ozone layer is slowly recovering. So change can happen, provided there is a political will to push for it. I am heartened to see that relatively few people today question the science of climate change. There are some, but they are becoming fewer and fewer, thanks in large part to the work of IPCC. But for COP21 to succeed here in Paris, we must go beyond science. We, we have to secure a global consensus with realistic targets for emissions control. So I welcome the commitment of the G7 to make deep cuts in emissions and to gradually phase out fossil fuels. I hope all countries, all countries will come to Paris in November with similar intentions. We must adopt action policies to decouple economic growth from the ever greater use of coal oil, gas, 
and ensure a faster shift to renewable energy sources. This will require carbon pricing and phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies. However, as was the case with Montreal Protocol, the wealthier countries must provide financial resources and technologies to aid poorer countries to cut emissions and adapt to the impact of climate change. Specifically, developed countries must deliver on their commitment to mobilize annually, to mobilize annually $100 billion for the Green Climate Fund by 2020. We must not forget that Africa can and has to be part of the solution to climate change. Africa is already experiencing the damaging impact of climate change, yet no region has done less to contribute to global warming than Africa. In 2012, Sub-Saharan Africa without South Africa emitted only 2% of the total global greenhouses and green gas emissions. If left unchecked, climate change will turn vast areas of uh, productive land in Africa into dust bowls, creating widespread hunger and mass displacement of rural populations. Increased competition over arable land and fresh water is already creating conflict amongst local communities and provoking tensions between states. But by tapping into its vast potential for renewable energy, Africa can boost economic growth, create jobs, and avoid the high carbon pathway that has brought the world to the brink of catastrophe. I want to stress, however, that the solution to the climate crisis in Africa and elsewhere cannot be left to governments alone. It requires the active participation of individuals, civil society, and business. Thankfully, we are seeing promising examples of such leadership. Companies are shifting away from fossil fuels to renewable energy and are driving research, innovation, and investment to facilitate the transition to green economy. Six of Europe's largest oil and gas companies have recently called on governments to introduce global carbon pricing system. Major airlines are investing in environmentally friendly fuels generated from farm waste and animal fats. The successful Autolib electric car sharing scheme here in Paris is another example of how the private sector can develop green alternatives and contribute to cutting air pollution. Civil society groups are launching worldwide campaigns for climate justice and putting pressure on businesses and governments to meet their responsibilities. And as individuals, we can support these efforts through our own actions. Each of us can, for example, use energy efficient light bulbs, power down our electric devices, and recycle waste. It may not seem much, like much, but it adds up. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, climate change is the ultimate, most emblematic challenge in this age of globalization. For the sake of our grandchildren, we cannot ignore that challenge. We have the duty to bequeath to them a world where all of mankind lives in peace and harmony with nature. As an African proverb says, the earth is not ours. It is a treasure we hold in trust for our children and grandchildren. We must be worthy of that trust. 
let us develop a global conscience based on well-being of our planet that transcends national boundaries or group and self-interest. Every nation and every individual working together must strive to defeat the threat of global warming. We can succeed, but it would require sustained and determined leadership. And here we may find what John F. Kennedy has advised once, especially relevant. He said, and I quote, by defining our goals more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we can help all people to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly towards it, end of quote. And allow me to conclude by reminding us that when leaders fail to lead, the people will lead and make them follow. The people will lead and make them follow. Look around you. The signs are all around us from country to country. People are taking the lead and demanding change. In good conscience, we must not fail them. Thank you very much. Son Excellence, Monsieur Michael Higgins, President of Ireland, a bien vouloir monter à la tribune. Michael Higgins, President of the Irish Republic. Outrun Public na Franke, Monsieur le Président, dear friends. I wish to thank President Hollande for his invitation to be here and to address you today on the theme of the power of ideas for climate, making a new beginning. May I congratulate the President of France on his initiative, and my hope is that our sharing of perspectives will help yield the positive result that we all need from the World Conference here in Paris at the end of November. Climate change is the great challenge of our time, already challenging most severely those already poor, for whom, if we do not act, it will deliver devastation. And ours may be the final generation with the opportunity to effectively respond to the now urgent, uncontested effects of climate change. So this year, 2015, marks a defining moment for the future of humanity. In this year, we will decide on what must be a shared universal response to climate change and on a practical agenda for action and measures for accountability. We will also, of course, this year decide on what should be sought as development in the wake of the Millennium Development Goals we will have to develop a new response to global poverty, increasing global inequality, at a time of increasing global inequality. The meetings in Addis Ababa, New York, and again here in Paris, taken together then, constitute a sequence of proximate and interlinked moments where the governments of the world are confronted with urgent choices, choices that cannot be avoided for the present and particularly for future generations. But yet, if these challenges exist, the opportunities too are there. Leaders and their representatives, as we have heard, are presented with opportunities to construct a new order for humanity and our planet. The political and technical decisions that are to be made over the coming months may be complex. And I so salute those who are working on that complexity. But ultimately, the great challenges of our time are ethical and intellectual in their nature. It is especially fitting, then, 
that we have been offered this opportunity by President Hollande to consider what are questions of conscience and within conscience intergenerational justice, and that we do so here in Paris, a city of the heart of a great French intellectual tradition. Whether we succeed or fail in the work ahead will be determined, I believe, by the response we bring to what is now the irrefutable evidence of science. But two, we will be challenged as to the degree of our moral courage, our ethical values, and the inspiration that we can call upon, and the inspiration we can bring forth. We need to break away from a destructive relationship with the diver diversity that is the life on our planet towards a new paradigm of existence, one that will be built on the respect we must have for the wonderment and renewal of nature, once available to all people, poor and not so poor. But we must begin with an acceptance of the evidence of science, and in that we have made significant progress. It is now clear that failure to respond to the scientific reality of climate change may ultimately lead to the destruction of life on our planet. We must therefore unequivocally reject the position of those who would obscure the scientific reality of climate change in their protection of any narrow and short-term self-interest. The first ethical test is in accepting that there can be no compromise with truth. We must also reflect on the historical pathway that has brought us to this point. It cannot be evaded, nor should it be avoided. Climate change has come about, has an intellectual origin in a hubris that regarded nature as a subject for domination and exploitation. We must acknowledge that the human causes behind climate change have identifiable historical contexts, grounded in forms of development and industrialization that were based on the exploitation of, for example, fossil fuels, with an assumption of infinite growth. So the complex questions of duties, justice and balance must be considered with this historical context and legacy in mind, and with acceptance of the ecological debt that is owed by the more developed nations to those nations who continue to aspire to an equal world of opportunities even of sufficiency, for freedom to achieve sufficiency, and a human flourishing with sustainability. Extreme individualism manifesting itself as insatiable consumption and accompanied by unconscionable levels of inequality characterizes much of what is regarded as the developed part of our planet. For some, it is the single truth of our times, a hegemonic model that cannot be contested, somewhat like the times of Galileo Galilei. The narrow paradigm of progress now threatens the destruction of the habitat which our fellow humans inhabit, as well as precipitating unsustainable levels of poverty and inequality in our human communities with all their consequences. Many, as Teddy Swearingen has put it, are living on this planet as if we had another one to go to. Yet at the heart of most cultures, there is, I believe, a disposition towards ethics. I have encountered it in the young and in the old and in different places of the world. A disposition that goes beyond reciprocity, that seeks to transcend and is in harmony with the wonder of nature. And one of the great lessons also of the history of humanity is that we are regularly presented with an opportunity to embrace new possibilities, to break away from failed paradigms and modes of thought. Ideas and the triumph of idealism over self-interest were what inspired us in 1945 to seek a new world that might be based on solidarity and, for example, the universality of human rights. That was acknowledged by such as Albert Einstein, who famously said with an extraordinary prescience, we shall need a substantially new way of thinking if humanity is to survive. So now, as in 1945, 
a new normative framework is needed. We need to confront the hegemonic ethic of individualism in its extremes. We need to confront insatiable consumption that is at the roots of our behaviour and replace it with a new thinking which reconnects us to our planet of diversity and which seeks and sets a new balance between the discourses of economics, ethics and an integrated ecology. For this task, we will need new tools, the crafting of which can be the most exciting intellectual opportunity of our time, reconciling science and ethics. There is cause for optimism that this new thinking is emerging, the return of interest to the age-old human institution of the commons, the interdependence and shared responsibility that that encapsulates is but one example. In the spiritual traditions, and I instance contemporary writings such as Laudato Si, the concept of ecology of integration is now prominent. And in turn, from the tradition of human rights, the theories of climate justice and of, envir and of environmental rights as human rights have come forward and taken root. All of these valuable intellectual and spiritual contributions, and the examples I have instanced of both, can, I believe, combine to inform a new ethical framework on which a new harmonious and sustainable paradigm, not only of development, but of true security, can be built. We must accept, however, that the moral imperative for action will not necessarily flow from any simple presentation of a case from reason, revelation or understanding. We must be candid about the global capacity for change, the obstacles to change, and we must recognise that to reconstruct our models of economics and development will involve many instances, in many instances, swimming against the tide. It will involve, require moral courage. We must be realistic too about the current state of our law and politics. Our current malaise is grounded in a cynicism that we must confront and despair. There is too among our citizens a disconnect with representative and deliberative democracy that we must recognise and set about to heal. We need inclusive, humane and non-judgmental engagement with the voices of those most affected by climate change and we must place them at the centre of the proposed solutions. <clears throat> I perceive among the populations of the world, and especially among the young, a search for beauty and a yet retained sense of awe at the harmony of nature. Among the elders of the planet, there is also respect for the potential of the inherited wisdom of the world released in the world to inform institutions and policies in new circumstances. When history records the actions we take or fail to take at this our moment of truth, we will not have the excuse either that we did not understand, that we did not know. We have been gifted in a global communications order with the knowledge and the opportunity to act. Would it not be the greatest of all human achievements, however, if we were to succeed in delivering the benefits of science, the shared wisdom, instinct and intuition of diverse cultures, and the products of reason and faith, and in delivering all of these through new balanced models of development, ecology and society? Then we might say, that when facing the fullness of our challenge, we made the decisions that offered a shelter, that protected the vulnerable of the present, and at the same time offered creative and imaginative possibilities for future generations. In this, let us succeed together. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Et j'invite maintenant Son Altesse Sérénissime, le Prince Albert. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like now to invite uh, Prince Albert II of Monaco to come to the microphone.
Monsieur le Président de la Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President of the Republic, Mr. President of the Economic, Social, and Environmental Council, ministers, excellencies, all authorities, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Say it is the worst of times. This is the worst period. As uh, Sylvia Coral has written, an, oceanog uh, an oceanographer, but it is also the best of times because we still have a chance. And this is the best of times because we still have a chance. So we still have a chance to, to stop this climate change, and this is a challenge for our generation. Humankind has long ignored the perils uh, weighing in on their environment, and they have denied climate change for a long time. And here we are at a crossroads. So we have science on our sides, which on a daily basis uh, tells us more about the damage we are doing to our planet. We also have conscience f uh, in our favor, coming from a series of uh, reflections which has been developing with an unprecedented f speed. We also have a need to act while there is still time. We also have more and more means to do so because up until now, there are a number of technological and technical solutions, alternative solutions, which we all are familiar with in order to help us come up with a mode of development that is respectful for, of nature. We are living a crucial period in our decisions. We know that uh, our decisions today will truly affect our future. And of course, here we are faced with ourselves, uh, our lacks and our responsibilities and the consequences of our actions. Now, when I commit to deal with the damage to our environment and the planet in peril for threatened seas, for fragile environments, I am looking at both object personal and universal objectives. Here we are dealing with imperatives that are deeply rooted in my conscience, but are also uh, concerning the entire world. First of all, we need to work for humanity, men and women confronted with increasing difficulties our contemporaries also are the generations to come. And going beyond nature, we are also talking about humankind, that we, are, we need to learn how to live in harmony with our environment, to think about our future without deteriorating the conditions of our survival. And just as with any kind of danger, what is striking our climate is, of course, also going to affect the most vulnerable among us, creating new inequalities and a greater and greater gaps and a deeper and deeper fractures. So working for the environment and for the climate is thus, first of all, to work for humanity. And here again, we need to provide incentives to our contemporaries to go further, to go past our selfishness, our short-term vision, our anthropocentrism. And thus, it is also a question of understanding that today what we do has consequences for those who are both close to us and far away, and also that they will determine the conditions of existence of those who will be coming after us. Thus, it is uh, learning to preserve and to share our, our Earth in order to create a better equilibrium. Also, we need to understand altruism, trying to seek a harmonious way to cohabit on the same planet together. And thus, it is also a question of inventing a new kind of mode of living, which does not involve a predatory approach to resources, the deterioration of ecosystems, the constant exploitation of both our, the land and the sea. On the contrary, we need to come, we need to, come to a mode of development that reconciles humanity to its future and offers uh, positive perspectives to all. Fighting against climate change is, again, to reconnect with authentic progress a progress which is shared among all on a global basis. This new model, which we must develop, also involves mobilizing each one of us to change the way we move, we travel, we eat, we consume, we heat our houses, in fact, our entire lifestyle. We need to con convince everyone that nothing will be done against them, but nothing can be done without everybody's goodwill. Thus, all the major innovations, as we know, on terms of usages and habits, must be mobilized. And mobilizing for the climate means working together, learning to work together, as we are doing today, to thinking about changes in the world on a planetary scale, a planet that is rich of billions of human beings, all of which have similar objectives. 
all of whom have similar objectives. So thus, our mobilization involves a personal path also, which comes from our very deepest choices and the meaning we wish to give to our existence. We will not be resigned. We will not accept this decline. We need to exercise uh, willpower. In the crisis we are fighting today, everyone in their own way and our, with our own means, is not simply your ordinary crisis. It is, in fact, a crisis of meaning, which will find its solution in a project that we will build for humanity as a whole. And politicians and industrialists, um, in all, both in ethical terms and scientific terms involving all aspects of our existence, in fact, we need to engage in a truly introspective process. Thus, this is why this summit appears to me to be essential, and I am extremely honored to participate here. This period of preparation of this COP21, where France and your government and yourself, Mr. President of the Republic, is mobilizing so much talent and energy, these questions are, of course, of extraordinary importance. And in fact, the American author, Leo Buscardia, has also underlined that the world is full of possibilities, and as long as there are possibilities, there is always hope. So we can, of course, only lose hope if we refuse to look at those possibilities. This is why it is important that through our various ans answers and the issues we will deal with together, that our exchanges will help us understand the nature of the path we must take both uh, in terms of our public actions and what uh, we do within. So we are exploring also this idea of allowing each one of us to walk down this path, in turn giving all the various moral, intellectual, and material ways to understand the situation via training and education and information by alerting on a constantly alerting our contemporaries to the situation and giving them concrete perspectives for change, for progress, and for hope. There is no doubt but that this day of uh, exchange and sharing will help us advance on a collective basis along this path. Thank you so much. I would now like to invite the President of the French Republic, Mr. François Hollande. Monsieur le Président. Mr. President of Ireland, Your Holiness, the President of the Economic, Social, and Environmental Council, ladies and gentlemen, who represent the diversity of the world, a diversity of conviction, of religion, and continents, territories. We have all come together here today, just before our Paris conference, which will be held in December 2015, and will decide the future of our planet for some time to come. Now, here I would like to say, or give you my vision of what is at stake. We need to conclude an agreement which could is global in nature, also mandatory and differentiated, which can be applied everywhere and which also can be respected. So thus, this uh, challenge also involves other objectives as well, which are well, will be discussed during the General Assembly of the United Nations in September. And upon the initiative of the Secretary General of UN, Ban Ki-moon. And we would we call these the millenary objectives, that is to say, the objectives for development. And these two negotiations for the climate, for development, are must be combined in order to carry our planet forward on a level which involves deep respect. We thus need all of us in order to arrive at these agreements. We need the heads of states and the governments, which represent us a certain legitimacy. We also need the local players who are committed. And we also need companies and corporations, but we also need the citizens of the world. No one can pretend to represent them. They are in and of themselves unique 
and multiple. There are billions of individuals, all of whom are asking themselves questions as to human destiny and its meaning, and in a certain way, you are representing them. Thus, they recognize themselves in the convictions that you are carrying forward in the rights you practice, in the philosophies that you, you share, also in terms of culture, the cultures that you are incarnating, thus and embodying, and thus we are conscious of what is the question of the individual in his most essential aspects, what motivates the individual, what gives him meaning. What is the relation that the individual has with others, with the world, with his own life? This is why we, it, that Nic, this is why Nicola Hulot recommended that we organize this summit in order to make conscience uh, give conscience uh, the most important place and call upon all of those men and women who in the world can inspire us. But they may also communicate, speak, express themselves, tell us what they think about what we have to do in December. Now it is true that science is a very precious tool for us. Science today indicates to us without any possible uh, contrary opinion that if nothing is done, our planet will continue to see its temperatures rising with to such a level and to such an intensity that we will have more and more difficulty living on our planet. There will be a succession of catastrophes, cycles, cyclones, desertification, and flooding, drought. And so we are able to fortunately set a certain number of objections, and it is thanks to the IPCC, a group of high-level experts, thanks to them we know that we must limit this warming to two degrees between now and the end of the century. Now, in order to succeed, we do need some uh, an agreement on the climate, an ambitious agreement, because we know that if nothing is done, it's not going to be a question of two degrees, but four degrees that uh, will, uh, in terms of uh, planetary warming, uh, that even today, with an agreement that could be what we s might hope to expect with the various contributions that have been uh, proposed by each state, to nevertheless we are going to rise above two degrees and even perhaps um, go as far as three degrees. So what can one do? Well, an agreement on climate means that we must renounce to using 80% of fossil fuels, which are easily accessible and which are still available to us. We can see this as a constraint, which is true. This is a constraint. But nevertheless, we can see this as an opportunity, building a safer and more equitable world and also developing, thanks to technological progress, developing various different types of energies, renewable energies, s s solar energy, geothermic energy, hydraulic energy, which will become a standard instead of an exception. This is a considerable change because here we will have an access to energy for all. Since these so-called renewable energies are in a certain way those that one we can produce without damaging the planet and using our resources. This is a question also of equitable development. As my predecessor said, changing the energy model is not something one can do in a single day. And in fact, we must ensure that there may be new ideas and innovations. And thanks to this, um, your testimonies and your commitment, we can already see or attempt to translate into achievable goals everything you have said. So emissions coming from the from farming represent almost a quarter of the global emission of greenhouse gases, which is a reality. However, if if we manage the land better, the involving prairies, of course, and also the wetlands and forests, they will be able to absorb and store 7 to 10 gigatons of carbon. And every year, in fact, up until 2030, which is approximately half of the total uh, emission reduction of CO2 that we need over the next 10 and 20 years. 
these actions will also have another effect, which will be to stimulate the fertility of the soil. Also, they will be also saving the harvest for some 500 million small farmers and contribute to food safety. And I'm taking you, giving you this example because it is the most significant. If we can save energy, if we can store what we do produce, if we can ensure the fertility of the land, we will be able to basically meet two challenges. First of all, uh, limiting uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and secondly, feeding the planet without any risk to that planet. So this kind of initiative, the 4 per 1,000, launched by the Minister of Agriculture, Stéphane Lafaux, in fact involves absorbing and storing the CO2 emissions and greenhouse gases that uh, come from farming. Here is something we can all do at our own level, but we also have here a question of safety and security for the world as a whole. So not having to leave one's country to try to find some kind of a living elsewhere, this is one of the fundamental rights of a human being. But it is also a guarantee of a safer world because we are today struck by uh, the incredible number of uh, population uh, movements. There are a number of refugees fleeing from terrorism, but we also have other people who are considered climate refugees. They are obliged to leave their village to separate themselves from their family because, very simply, it is no longer possible to live there and feed themselves. So again, here is what is at stake in Paris in December. This uh, challenge is so great. As I was saying, it requires uh, the mobilization of us all, and I am very happy to see your commitment, and thanks to your presence here, you are not the only ones, although, of course, with the consciences, we can, of course, already feel that we are at peace, but you are not alone, because you should not be alone, in fact. And there is, first of all, in Paris, we had a meeting of a number of CEOs who also contributed as well, sometimes via philanthropy, which does happen, but also thanks to a proper understanding of the economic uh, interest involved in this question, such that their investments and their decisions and their choices can be compatible with a planet we must preserve. Thus, they have a number of daring proposals or at least they would have appeared daring a few years ago, but they are now necessary. They, they are thus in favor of a tar carbon tax such that in various uh, arbitrations and choices for finance or various companies, thus we could have or integrate a certain number of climate standards such that we may see a form of a reconciliation between private interests and the general interest. And if our companies are also committed here, it is because they are conscious, too, of the risks. If uh, competition is exacerbated, there is, of course, a risk of seeing emergent, emerging countries developing without any constraint and using the planetary resources. At the same time, these emerging countries says that they, too, have the vocation of participating in globalization. Thus, uh, we see here a need to have a series of common rules. And also, in Paris and in Lyon, we saw a meeting of a number of local leaders and officials coming from throughout the world because, of course, the agreement, which I hope will be signed in December, will not be enforceable if those who are closest to the populations are also not com committed as well to save energy, to build new kinds of cities, to imagine new types of transportation, to preserve nature, to ensure that there will be group spaces reserved for the population. And thus, here again, we must involve them as well. And again, in Paris, thanks to UNESCO, and again, let me salute it, the general director. We have a series of scientists also who came together and believe that uh, 2015 could be a crucial year, that a true economic solution is possible. 
it would allow us to provide reasonable perspectives in terms of limiting climate uh, change and global warming. So Nicolas Hulot, when he suggested I organize a summit of consciences for the climate, he said that here this should be a kind of a moment for a pause so that we can think together prior to the conference on the climate to be held next December in order to respond to a crisis of civilization which is not identified as such. And he himself wished that the various moral and religious authorities could come and help the governments and states. It is not a simple proposal in a country like France, which is secular and which considers that it is the temporal realities that must uh, be take priority over the spiritual. However, this is, of course, not the right way to look at the uh, secularity. Secularity means to allow all convictions to prosper, all religions, all philosophies, to, for both believers and non-believers, such that they may all participate in this common reflection. And I would like to thank you for having accepted the invitation to help us try to find a path in a world characterized by a profusion of science and, as Nicolas Hulot said too, a deficit of conscience. So it is in this spirit as well that I read the encyclical of Pope Francis who suggests for all human beings to enter into a dialogue with all as regards our common home. This text cite, uh, mentions the precious reflections coming from other religions on the theme of ecology, and he also testifies to your contribution, Patriarch Bartholomew, who accompanied me to the Philippines yeah, not long ago. So the Summit of Consciences is also something that is taking note of these contributions. And starting from the fact that our climate crisis and more broadly ecological crisis cannot be reduced to a scientific, uh, technological, economic, or political dimension, however important they may be. Here we are talking about a crisis of meaning. The deep cause of the degradation of the environment and the climate is our lifestyle, our mode of production and of consumption, which is no longer compatible with human development. Thus, it is with respect to the planet that we need to think our relation, rethink our entire relation to the planet. We must thus share a series of ethical choices. And this is why we are in a need of your help in terms of rising to this high level of thinking. Over many years, every conference on the climate has given rise to a number of declarations and meetings, on uh, interreligious meetings. And whatever may be your your religion, but also believers and non-believers, all human beings living on the planet will have to meet this challenge. Thus, we have a distinct and clear connection between the respect for nature and also culture. So whenever nature is attacked, culture is also in danger. And every time nature may be promoted, culture also um, is enhanced as well. We have some examples. For example, France is, in, back in 1861, was the first country in the world to protect a natural area. In fact, it was the Forest of Fontainebleau, and it was upon the request of the painters of Brabizon, not because they wanted to just be all um, by themselves, but simply because for them it was their inspiration. And as you said, Mr. President, the beauty of the world is also one that allows us creation, not the creation of the world, but a creation by in the world of works that will remain with us forever. Thus, we have a common combat here when it comes to culture, thought, and respect for nature. It is also important to call upon others, and I do this everywhere I go, Fall de France, the Philippines, and the Southern Pacific. Today, you are those who will also be launching this call, such that every citizen, wherever he may live or she may live, whatever may be, their convictions, beliefs, they must be able to take part in this common destiny. And also, of course, understand the importance of this agreement being concluded in Paris. Thus, I think it is important to give meaning to progress. 
It is when there is no further awareness of progress that fear comes to be. And fear is, of course, the mother of all fanaticisms and extremisms and all kinds of isolationism and fundamentalism. And so we need to re we need to recreate a certain confidence in the future, believing that the world can be a better place, that there are risks and catastrophes to prevent, that but that it is possible, once again, to be able to win this battle. And it was said that the world was capable, after the second conflict during the 20th century, had completely devastated the planet, and there, of course, was nevertheless possible to invent another system, the United Nations, to invent rules and principles. Today, it is a similar process that we need to begin. We are here before a risk of a conflict with ourselves, and thus we must develop rules for the planet. And this is, of course, the meaning behind the Conference of Paris. Thus, we need to develop new paths forward. The question we're asking the human family is a question of its common destiny. We will also need to go back to a lifestyle and habits of certain types, but what is really at stake here is bringing a population, which has never been so numerous, to a life a, a lifestyle which has never yet been attained. Is it possible to have a planet with it, which is inhabited by more and more human beings where, nevertheless, it is still possible to live better? This is the duty that weighs down upon us, a planet where we will be more numerous but more miserable, a planet where we will have more, more wealth, wealthy but and more poor as well, a planet where we will have conflicts, which could be those of those who can live and those who can no longer live. These are the risks, and these, this is what is at stake, giving hope, a hope for populations that want to maintain their traditions, hope for those who wish to engage fully in modernity, hope also always at, uh, at, at our reach. So the 9th of July 19, in 1849, our great poet Victor Hugo, who was also a deputy, and he would express himself as follows, I am not, I am not sirs, and of course there are only men in the National Assembly at the time, and not among those who believe that one can eliminate suffering in this world. I am among those who believe and who affirm that one can eliminate poverty or destroy misery. So th today's misery is, is insupportable and tomorrow will be uncontrollable and it will be ungovernable, in fact, if we do nothing. Thus, for the citizens of the world, and I am proud of this, in fact, France remains a symbol. It is a symbol of freedom, freedoms and a symbol of the rights of man. And this is why last uh, January, when our, my country was struck by terrorism, we had uh, m many peoples and leaders of the world, all of whom supported us in that time. France is a country of freedom, which sometimes believes that it can open new paths forward. And thus, I believe that in December 2015, as in 1789, when uh, the French Revolution produced uh, a huge, produced hope throughout the world, perhaps now history once again will be written in Paris, this time for the future of the planet, because again we are still talking about liberty, the liberty and freedom of our children, in fact the freedom to live simply. Thank you very much for your contribution today. Merci. J'invite maintenant. Now I would like the Polyphonia Quartet to come to the floor. We have here a number of Palestinian and Israeli musicians playing together in this quartet.
Nous allons maintenant euh, saluer. Now we would like to welcome the President of the Republic.
Ladies and gentlemen, that was Polyphony, founded in 2011 to help bridge the gap, the cultural divide between the Arab minority and the Jewish minority, majority in Israel. They work with Jewish and Arab, Christian and Muslim children to introduce them to classical music and to bring communities together in the process. We are running a little late, for which apologies. And so there are a few small changes. Um, Dr. Bukova is with us this morning, but has to leave shortly. And so she and I are going to have a little discussion about uh, her role and her understanding. Would you please come and join me up here? I would be delighted. of UNESCO. Please come and yes, come and stand here. A pleasure, thank you. Dr. Bukhova, the heart of this is the question we are asking everybody. Why do I care? Can you tell us briefly why you personally care? Not so much professionally from UNESCO, we'll come to that in a moment, but why you I think it's very difficult to uh, separate the professional aspect from the personal one. Nowadays, and I would like to uh, commend Nicolas Hulot for his involvement and also the Conseil économique et social representing France and uh, all the uh, personalities present today, His uh, Highness, uh, all people who are highly involved. I represent the UNESCO, uh, the uh, United Nations organization, as uh, Nero used to say at the time, the conscience uh, of uh, humankind. And I think that we reason about this all the time. In our constitution, it is said that not only political and economic agreements matter for peace and development, but also solidarity, and mostly solidarity, intellectual and moral ethical solidarity must be at the forefront of our quest for peace. So the climate matters for peace, for development, for a sustainable development. Climate matters for conflicts, for poverty, for intolerance lack of human dignity, and therefore organizing such a summit for consciences, uh, which uh, really is complementary with the work we have conducted together with France, with uh, the French uh, Republic's president, because he referred to the major conference, uh, Scientific Man Conference, which was organized uh, in July in, at UNESCO. Before the uh, important discussion between private businesses uh, and governments uh, on climate. And this is a challenge that we need to rise to regarding ethical aspects, not only taking into consideration business, but also all the moral, ethical aspects that have uh, a connection with this important conference. And this summit is contributing towards it in a different way. It resonates with our mission. I think it is possible to organize a discussion with businessmen on the moral, ethical aspects. I think this is highly important. The discussion must take place also with the scientists and with civil societies. 50 years ago, Claude Lévi-Strauss, an anthropologist, a philosopher, who was very close to UNESCO. You remember maybe he met with the uh, so-called wild populations, wild tribes, to show that they belong to humankind. At the time, it was construed as a discovery, but I think it's part of a, uh, the moral discussion on climate change uh, and uh, climatic issues. And I think this conference is really complementary with uh, the general 
reflection on climate and ethical aspects. So I commend and salute all those who have participated in its organization, and UNESCO is also committed in participating in this. Personal from your professional role, but can you tell us, is there a moment in your childhood as you were growing up when you began to appreciate the role of culture in terms of helping us as a civilization, as a humanity, to understand our place? A moment for you, personally. Oui, pour moi, c'est vraiment, uh, c'est très, très personnel aussi. Uh, c'est difficile uh, de parler des... It's very personal for me. It's difficult to talk about personal questions in front of such a, a large room. But of course, you have uh, inspired a certain number of reflections. So I come from a multicultural, multi-religious country as well. And I think in my childhood, we had this cultural diversity, this atmosphere. I come from a very small town where most of the people are Muslim. And it's sort of a mixture of Christians and Muslims. And I learned very early on how important it was to have this cultural diversity and tolerance. And this also sort of piqued my curiosity about the world and my curiosity with regard to other religions, other cultures. I also learned some foreign languages. I learned about other cultures now. And I believe that today I can say this curiosity has been transformed into a profession, into a sort of professional interest. And I was, it also encouraged me very much to work such that UNESCO and, the, and this organi the organization, which is deeply rooted in uh, respect for cultural diversity, and that is why I believe that we often mention the declaration of UNESCO, which was very important and highly relevant, I believe, to our debate. It is the Declaration of 2011 on Cultural Diversity. And in this declaration, we also have a connection between cultural diversity and biodiversity. And in this declaration, we say, in fact, we declare that cultural diversity for humanity is like biodiversity for nature. And I think this connection is extremely important today. Thank you very much. Thank you. For It gives me great pleasure to now invite the man whose uh, vision lies behind today, Nicholas Fuller. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what better message, what more beautiful symbol, powerful symbol could you deliver and outside of your simple presence here? Because you are in this prestigious assembly sending out a message that the unity of the world is no longer an option. It has become a condition. If we want to deal with the challenges we face at the beginning of the century, and your second message here would be that the condition of this unity is first and foremost the respect for diversity. And that this diversity is magnificent and I would also like to say that your presence, often in spite of many, for many of you, a, a large distance to come here five months before the Paris conference, for me, this is a wonderful encouragement, which is something that truly warms our heart. So I'd also like to thank the Economic, Social, and Environmental Council for having spontaneously volunteered not only to welcome us, but also to participate with the Bayard Press Group and ARC, with uh, the R20, which is led by Arnold Schwarzenegger, they all contributed to organizing our Summit of Conscience. So Martin Palmer is soon going to talk to us 
and invite us, in fact, and this is true for all of you who have uh, some responsibility with regard to the Conference of Parents, she's inviting us to answer a, a very simple question. Why should we care? And it's true that we often forget to ask these essential questions. We're overwhelmed by our function, our commitments. We sometimes forget to redefine of the ends, to share a vision, to ask ourselves questions that are fundamental. And I hope that in Paris, everyone will at some point be able to go beyond your approach, your function, and just connect with your mission as a human being. What is going to be happening in Paris? Well, as you know, as well as we do, what we have here is to deal with uh, the future of humanity. Will we ultimately become human? Are we going to be able to be different from other living beings because we are part of nature and we have a privilege of being part of the living sphere, which is an exception in the universe. It is not a, the standard. We are the conscious part of nature. Does this consciousness, is this something we can now honor? And with regard again to the question, why should we care? Why should we take care of the planet? Well, it's not just the planet, because the planet could very well certainly do without humanity. However, the reverse is not true. Humanity can certainly not do without the planet. Now, if I was to give a res an answer to this question, why should we each act where in, in our own way, in our own area? Well, there is perhaps a single reason, which is the probably the most complex. Basically, let us try to avoid our children hating us in the future because we are in a situation to destroy the future. We could be lying to our children because we have absolutely no argument here. We, there is no doubt as to our responsibility to humanity about the climate uh, crisis. It can no longer be a uh, question of the argument of saying, well, what can one do given such a complex situation? This is not valid anymore either. Einstein was saying that our period is characterized by a profusion of means and a confusion of intentions. And the profusion of means is human genius. It is there. It is not more knowledge. It is not more technology, nor is it more science that we need. What we need is an additional soul. We need conscience. We need a vision that make with meaning, a meaningful vision. And this is really what is at stake in Paris. We need to reconnect with meaning. But why should we act now? Because behind the ter general term of climate change, we have here a profound civilizational and cultural crisis. And we also have men, women, and children who are, ex who are waiting in despair for us to deal with the causes of their suffering. The climate crisis adds injustice to injustice, poverty to poverty, inequality to inequality. Let us keep in mind this fact, but the message we also need to send to um, leaders throughout the world, the climate crisis is the ultimate injustice. It is probably the injustice that will make men, women, and children who have not been able to take into, who are not able to profit from our development, but rather are, being, are suffering its consequences. And I'd also like or hope that each responsible person meditate on this prediction, which we hope we will not be realized. Be careful that the fatalism of some does not develop the fanaticism of others. This is exactly what is going to be happening in Paris. Paris is going to be peace or conflict. We have chosen peace. We are going to attempt to connect, and we hope to give humanity its uh, letters of mobility. Thank you very much.
Dear Nicola, for uh, an inspirational presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, because the, the President was a little late, we are running a little late. The way that we propose to now move forward is to invite our two most distinguished guests, His All Holiness and His Eminence the Cardinal, to speak in a few moments. And then at about quarter past 11, we will break for coffee. So the other speakers this morning in the opening session, you will be on immediately after coffee. Coffee we will limit to 20 minutes, if that's okay. Um, I'm English, so it doesn't really matter if you only have 20 minutes for coffee, because you're not serving good tea, so why should I care? So, <laughs> and I'm sure the French can down a coffee in about one minute. So uh, we hope that will work. So we will break at quarter past, uh, thereabouts, depending on our two uh, keynote speakers now, and then reconvene 20 minutes later. Please listen out for the bell. I have known His All Holiness, the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople now, since 1989. And I have watched as he, amongst all Christian leaders in the world, has taken the lead in ecology since uh, the late 80s. Uh, that's why he is known to many as the Green Patriarch. Your All Holiness, it gives me the greatest pleasure to invite you to speak to us today. Son Altes Serenissim, Le Prince Albert. Your Serene Highness Prince Albert of Monaco, President of the Economic, Social, and Environmental Council, dear Nicola Ulo, Eminences, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. In a call from Manila, in conjunction with the French and Filipino authorities in 2015, we were all individually and collectively called to act in favor of the climate. Today, more than ever, we recall the urgency of a global approach and also solidarity between the financial and economic sectors. Thus, we'd like to call upon all the players, citizens, statesmen, politicians, to fully play their role in the fight against climate change, and specifically against its effects and the reduction of the risk of natural catastrophes linked to climate change through individual initiatives and also cooperative action. Now, we were there with His Excellency, the President of the Republic, and we were able to see with our own eyes the destructive effects of climate change, which affect the most vulnerable populations, especially in Asia. We also were able to see concrete, touch this fresh wound, which is fresh but, but uh, long term and also a revolt against this blind egocentrism of humanity. The most skeptical now would not have been less convinced than St. Thomas himself. So the apostolic uh, express, uh, exclamation, my Lord, my God, also comes from our own mouths, not only as a cry of warning, but also as a awakening to hope. The imperious mission in general and of Christianity in particular, has to do with this transfigurating force of the faith. Thus, any danger becomes a call for the conversion of the heart. Decades of experience in the ecumenical patriarchy in terms of the protection of the environment have shown us that the question 
of salvation is not independent from the way we treat creation. And in this particular intention, we see also a coming together of both secular and spiritual, distinguishing what comes from the world in the sense of the Apostle Paul, and what has to do with the creation of the world, which is in the Orthodox tradition involving the mystery of grace in our creation, making everything a sacrament of the heavens. And so some may ask themselves questions about the necessity of uh, religious leaders being involved in such reflections because of the technical aspects or the guilt-producing concept section in terms of the consequences of our actions and the meaning of involving religions in this crucial battle for saving our planet. There are three reasons for this. So educating is the first, by which we mean to continue the dialectic between faith and reason, meaning to combine and articulate the rational aspects with the inspirations of the soul. The question of the environment or environmental questions are also at the crossroads of this intention. Thus, uh, scientific uh, f facts on biodiversity, climate, uh, global warming, the increase of poverty and injustice on an environmental level, food safety, and so forth. All these also are part of the theological vision, which is often static, of um, whereas the world is in constant change. But having seen this simple fact, it is our mission now to offer, as starting from this basis, a hermeneutics of creation, which will affirm the interdependency of humanity and nature. Now, this is why the ecumenical patriarchy has set up on the 1st of September every year a day of prayer for the environment. We also organize seminars and summits that bring together scientists and theologians in order to ensure debate. And the last one was in the island of the Prince of Istanbul in Turkey some weeks ago. And it was entitled Ecology, Theology, and Art. Here we invited a number of artists in order that they pr could also give us their aesthetic expertise as to the meaning of beauty and creation. And in fact, Dostoevsky, did he not write that beauty will save the world. So, conversion. By conversion, we need to understand the conversion of the inner self as the point of departure of the conversion without. Scientists constantly focus on the need for some kind of radical change of our lifestyles in order to limit the polluting actions that also influence climate change. And here we are talking about a reality that Christianity would call metanoia or metania. And thus here we are seeing <coughs> complete change in the being, which encourages in the patristic tradition the prayer in the desert, this spiritual experience forged over centuries coming from ascetic experience as well, a sort of a true vision of humanity. And this has constantly questioned the need, for, or our needs in general, to dissociate between what has to do with greed and what has to do with the good. Ethics and morality are certainly not far here. They sh must enable us or to permit the emergence of the glory of the earth itself. This is the meaning of the efforts that is expected from us. That is to say, we need to get away from, the, from egoism, where we see also the inertia of our habits and hopefully discover the freedom that we can achieve thanks to the conversion of the heart. Finally, glorify. 
by which we return to the very fundamentals of our spiritual mission. And finally, on our native island of Imbros in Turkey, we also were s s truly impressed by this powerful, beautiful natural environment constantly renewed by the force of the winds, which also made us become aware of the double reality. And first of all, that the power of humanity is inversely proportional to the power of nature. Also, in order to solve this antinomic relationship, we need to become not masters of creations, but rather we need to free creation from the dominating effect of human action in a movement of uh, action of grace which will be revealed through the daily gestures and acts that we make. <clears throat> These are the three commitments that I believe are indispensable for an ecological, a true ecological spirituality. And fourth page, I will try to shorten my speech here. Dear friends, dear friends, before I conclude this modest, uh, in this modest presentation, I would like to congratulate the French authorities for their many initiatives in view of our meeting of the COP21, which will be held here in Paris at the end of the year. The, patri the ecumenical patriarchy is particularly attached to this uh, meeting and we give it our complete support. Our responsibility is certainly uh, equal to the urgency of the situation. This is why we are so strongly committed. Thank you very much. Merci, Votre Santé nous Thank you. Thank you, Your Highness, for having uh, suggested that we uh, perform this uh, transition. So Torsen comes from Ghana, President uh, of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, uh, Eminence Cardinal Torsen. Uh, he's also uh, going to talk about uh, Laudate Si, the encyclical that Pope uh, Francesco disclosed a few weeks ago in Rome. Bonjour. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Delevoye, President of the uh, Conseil Economique et Social et l'Environnement. Mr. Nicolas Hulot, organizer of this event. Ladies and gentlemen, ministers. Uh, of religions or state secretaries. As uh, Kofi Annan did before me, and he comes from the same country as me, Ghana, I would like to switch to English. Organization and to commend Mr. Hulo, the government of France, for having accepted to host this event, to have us express our commitment to the issue of pushing and fighting for climate change. My dear friends, coming from every corner of the globe, your presence here reminds us of the global character of the challenge before us. At stake is the well-being of the Earth, our common home. And the world situation leads us to discover that different yet important perspectives are ever more intertwined and complementary. The riches of faith and of spiritual tradition, the seriousness of scientific research, and the concrete effort at various levels of both government and civil society, all for an equitable and sustainable development. And so as you may know, and it's been referred to several times this morning here, a similar concern for the well-being of the earth, our common home, 
has made Pope Francis publish last June 18th an encyclical on integral ecology entitled Laudato Si and the Care for Our Common Home. The same expression, care. And it is important to reflect deeply on the, that expression. In the past, we were used to hearing about stewardship of creation. Now the expression most popularly used by in the writings of Pope Francis has been the care. We can express and live stewardship without any personal deep sense of commitment. But when we care for something, it is with passion, and it is with a heart, and with a lot of commitment and an attachment. That's why the Pope talks about care, and that's why we gathered here this morning also to celebrate the need to care for the earth. It's an invitation to embrace our commitment to the earth and to the universe with a sense of passion, not only with thoughts and ideas, but also with the heart. When the Holy Father, Pope Francis, then talks about and develops his care for integral ecology, ecology of the human person and ecology of the earth, he highlights the fact that humanity, in fact, is not separate from the environment. Pope Benedict had said the book of nature is one, one of humanity and one of nature. Pope Francis also wanted to highlight the accelerating change in climate and to affirm that this is undeniable, that it is catastrophic and it is worsened by human activities. But it is also amenable and can be changed by the same human person. He also affirms that the grave errors that increase our disastrous indifference to the environment include also a throwaway culture of consumerism and a naive consequence that technology and technological advance can fix every problem. Then he emphasizes and invites us as all to address the ethical nature of our commitment and the ethical nature of our cities both through dialogue and by recovering our fundamental spiritual dimensions. So a big point that Holy Father makes in that encyclical is that realities are more important than ideas. And so whatever we think about and say, we need to follow it up with deep and sincere commitment. Commitment to seeing what we think about and what we propose come to reality. In fact, the central question asked in Laudato is in this encyclical is similar to the concern that has brought us here. And it is, what kind of world we would want to bequeath to our children? And following this up, the Holy Father devolves this and will simply invite us to recognize that an environment will not be able to sustain life after us nor place an unending strife among people unless, again, we embrace a commitment to change and to improve upon it. And so the challenge to us is we receive the garden as our home, and we may not turn it into wilderness for our children. That simply would not be fair, and that simply would not be just on our part. The garden we received must be passed on and bequeathed always as a garden a place taken care of, and a place nurtured and developed. And so, my brothers and sisters, Pope Francis would wish us to know that the climate is a common good, a global common, if you want, belonging to all and meant for all. Yet the cost of climate change are being borne disproportionately by those who have least contributed to it. Overall, climate change is a global problem with a spectrum of serious implications, environmental, social, economic, and political. And so facing our leadership is the urgent need to develop policies so that in the next few years, 
the emission of carbon dioxide and other highly polluting gases can be drastically reduced. The use of highly polluting fossil fuels, especially coal, especially oil and, to a lesser degree, gas, need to be progressively replaced without delay with intelligent and widespread access to and use of renewable energy, facilitating this energy transmission transition that we gathered here to pledge ourselves to. So lamenting the failure of past global summits on the environment, the Holy Father wishes in the encyclical to call urgently for enforceable international agreements to stop climate change. He gives very many practical examples at different levels of what can be done to reverse the trend of global warming and to reduce some of the negative impact of climate change. And so does pray for a favorable outcome of this session, just as what will follow in December this year. The COP21 conference for climate change here in November, from November 30th to 11th of December, will be very crucial in identifying strong solutions for climate change accompanied by the gradual framing and acceptance of Biden commitments. The sustainable goals then, also to be celebrated earlier on in September, are relevant in this context. For the 13 proposed sustainable development goals, all do correspond and relate closely with the events related with the climate change. Goal number 11, for example, make cities and human settlement inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Goal number 12 would have us ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. And goal number 14 would have us conserve and sustainably use the ocean, the seas, and the marine resources for sustainable development. Just as goal number 15 would have us protect restore and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage forests, combat desertification, and halt and reverse land degradation, and so halt biodiversity loss. And so, my dear friends, the single biggest obstacle to the imperative to change course is not economic and it's not scientific. It's not even technological. Rather, what it is, is that it's our minds and our hearts that can stand in the way of our decision to change course. So at the end of the day, it is conscience and it is our ethical commitment. The same mindset which stands in the way of making direct decisions to reverse the trend of global warming also stands in the way of achieving the, global, the goal of eliminating poverty once and for all and a more responsible overall approach is needed than to deal with both problems, the reduction of polluting and the development of poorer countries and regions. Such a courageous reform will take place only if we heed the call to seek other ways of understanding the economy and of progress. The political decisions and dimensions need to re-establish democratic control over the economy and over finance, and to recognize that while dimensions of this are local and particular, their implications are transnational and global. And so the part before us is a challenging one, one that demands particularly from the developed world humility, sobriety, and sacrifices that all may share in the boundless wonders and blessings that we receive from God to make this our home. And this is the part. This commitment to changing our changing course is the part of the entire human family. It is the part that has brought us all here, and it is the part that's going to lead us all to COP21 here in France come November and come December. 
And our prayerful wishes is that when the world leads their good gather here next November and December, they'll be as committed to realizing a cause and changing cause as we are committed in gathering here this next this uh, this uh, few days. And our prayers accompany you all. And so while we do congratulate you, Mr. Hulot, and the government of France for having hosted this, so do we commit the future commitment to a change of course into the hands of God for his own courage and for blessings. Thank you. Merci, Eminence, nous avoir rappelé comme ça. Thank you for having reminded us of the way uh, Pope uh, Francis uses the word care. Ten minutes for coffee, ten minutes for coffee. Make sure you're back in ten minutes.
Can I have them? Uh, thank you. Then, would you please be seated as we're going to start in two minutes. Two minutes, we will start. Please take your seats. We will start in one minute. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to start now, as time is very tight. Uh, the president, as you know, was a little late, and some of our earlier speakers uh, had a lot to say. We are going to pick up where we left off, which is the session uh, of the opening session about why should we care, and we have uh, a number of highly distinguished contributors who will lead us into that thinking. It gives me great pleasure to first of all ask Rabbi David Rosen, the former Chief Rabbi of Ireland, who is the International Director of the Interreligious Affairs of the American Jewish Committee. He served as a member of the World Economic Forum C100, a council of 100 leaders formed for the purpose of improving relationships and cooperation between the Muslim and non-Muslim world. I'm delighted to welcome David, and could I ask all our speakers now to emulate His All Holiness, the Ecumenical Patriarch, who kept within his time splendidly. David, a delight, and over to you. Thank you, Martin. I will do my best to compensate for those who had a lot to say because everything they said was very important, and therefore it's less important for me to say those things a second time. But I've been asked to t tell a story that is as personal as possible, and the best I can do is tell a story from my own tradition. And those within my heritage will be very familiar with it. The story is about 1,600 years old, and it tells of how when God created the first human person, he placed that person in the garden and displayed all the beauties of the wonderful garden that had been created for humanity. And God said, look at what I have created, how beautiful and how blessed and how good it all is. Take care that you do not destroy it, for if you, dis you destroy it, there is no one left to restore it. This midrash, this homiletical tradition, expresses the power of the gift of human responsibility, the power we have to both generate, to glorify, and to destroy, and to devastate. So why is this important? It's important, why do we care? Why should we care about this issue? Because this is the critical issue for the future of humanity. Anything else, in effect, is rearranging the chairs on the Titanic while we move forward to total destruction on the iceberg. And therefore, this must be the paramount concern of our times. Climate change doesn't take place in a vacuum. The implications have already been alluded to. But climate change takes place in a context of where untold barbarities are accepted as the norm in the livestock trade simply to provide for human indulgence without any conscience or sense of responsibility. It takes place where there's unbridled avarice, where 17% of our world uses 80% of its resources. 
where there is irresponsible development and growth and pollution of our environment. In effect, climate change is purely a symptom of the diseases that we have engaged in, and it is a cri de coeur, it is a call on the part of this creation that we have been given for us to respond. In Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23, we are told, the earth is the Lord's, we are told that the earth is Lord's, and that we are sojourners and tenants with God. In chapter 26, following on from that, we are told that our understanding of our limitations, that we are tenants, as indicated earlier, and our awareness of the transcendent, that there is a higher reality, is the key to our peaceful future and well-being on the earth. In other words, climate crisis, the climate crisis is an opportunity for humanity, as has already been alluded to, to rediscover higher values, higher values than simply consumerism and material indulgence. This is the opportunity, and that is why it's so significant that the religions are here, so that that wisdom that comes from the religions of the world may be culled for the benefit of humanity, to recreate a culture of responsibility and not purely license for indulgence. And the importance of religion cannot be overestimated as an educational force and as the delivery system, as a Pew study has recently indicated, over 80% of the world defines itself in religious terms. I will conclude with another story. This story comes from the Talmud, so it's a little bit older. It's about 1,700 years old. And it tells of a sage by the name of Honi who came across a man planting a carob tree. And he said to the man, how long does it take for carob trees to bear fruit? He said, 70 years. So he said, do you think you'll live that long to see carob fruit and to enjoy it? He said, of course not. But as there were those that planted carob trees for me, which I now benefit from, so it is my responsibility to plant carob trees for future generations. And that is our responsibility, ladies and gentlemen. May we be worthy of it. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur le Rabbin, et merci d'avoir tenu. Thank you, Rabbi, and thank you for having uh, complied with your allotted time. Professor Abdur Filali Ansari, founder of the Aga Khan Institute uh, based in Casablanca, he explained yesterday he was a Senate working for a shit, so, uh, and this is already a symbol. Dear colleagues and friends, His Highness uh, Prince Aga Khan, spiritual guides of a community of uh, Sh Shiite uh, Muslims, has uh, given me the honor as a Senate representative uh, to talk on his behalf uh, today uh, regarding uh, something which is absolutely vital for the future of humanity, showing that even in dark times, such as the ones that many Muslim communities are experiencing right now with uh, bloody fights between uh, some of their groups, that we need to accept each other, that we need to respect each other's religion, and that this is still something that Muslims believe in, Muslims who are proud of their legacy and who want to draw lesson from this for the future of humankind. This also shows that beyond the mere divisions and the divides between uh, religions, there are com there is common ground on which we can still built for the future. For those of you who uh, met His Highness, or those uh, who have had a chance to work in one of the institutions that he created, there is nothing surprising here, because His Highness only works with his attachment to, with pluralism and uh, the fact that he respects uh, the poorer of us, uh, whichever situation they are facing. So back to the question, why do I care? 
Well, I believe that we need to place things in a historical context, but in a very clear way. I'm tempted to say that only ever since the 17th, 18th century modern times, uh, humankind seems to have uh, adopted the statement according to which man owns nature. We are gathered here to try and uh, face the consequences of this belief, this behavior. And in this situation, I would like to agree with uh, the previous speaker. Muslims uh, can uh, freely claim that their sacred uh, book has invited them to behave differently. They simply want to be the guardians of common goods. Uh, long before humankind understood how deep the grave is that we are digging with our own hands, human beings saw themselves as uh, the guardians of the create of what the, uh, our creator had created and entrusted in their care. You have to care for something that is entrusted to you in trust, and this is considered as a sacred duty, and complying with this duty is an essential virtue. The current virtues familiar to all Muslims, uh, whichever group they belong to, 3372 claims that man accepted to uh, take in his uh, trust this uh, what was given to him by the Creator, acknowledging that man himself is part of the creation which he neither owns nor possesses and uh, simply must care for it with all the privileges granted to him by the uh, Creator. But the next verse also adds that man does not behave in a responsible way. I will not read the following one and I will skip to the rest of my presentation. So I would like to remind you of my religious tradition. I am not trying to make an apology here. I could say that one tradition is superior to the others or that one tradition is the only true tradition where all the others are false. But this kind of uh, behavior is no longer useful today, especially when it is hiding uh, behind indisputable truths. After having uh, reminded you of things that the Muslims are familiar with, I would like to also highlight the fact that most religious traditions and most wisdom inherited from previous uh, generations are cultivated in modern times give us lessons uh, whereby we should respect our environment and accept that human beings are part of the creation and not the owners of creation. And this is precisely the reason why I am absolutely convinced that religious wisdom and tradition inherited from the elders and uh, the modern our modern teachers are what we need today. I think this is a unique opportunity for us to achieve the objectives that we have uh, endeavored uh, to um, defend. Recently, for instance, uh, t attempts have been made to initiate a dialogue between cultures and civilizations and religions. For the very first time, we may base ourselves on the real convergence between the different visions of the world in order to make sure that all the players change their behavior in such a way that they will be able to face the challenges. I think we can, have, we can take this one step further. We can uh, turn this convergence in a concrete form uh, which uh, hides huge potentials. A few decades ago, most nations across the world were able to agree on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which uh, was really a turnaround in the political history of humankind. The uh, Declaration of Human Rights has become a kind of superior constitution accepted by all. I wonder whether we should start thinking about a uh, universal declaration of uh, human duties and not just human rights. Especially duties um, towards uh, all living beings, especially those who cannot defend themselves against uh, the powers recently acquired by human beings. Human beings used to be an animal, hunting for food and collecting in nature whatever he needed to survive. Things have changed, and man is now destroying 
everything that he has uh, survived on uh, for many years, destroying it also for the others, the other animals and the other living beings. If such a declaration were to be accepted, well, yesterday our friend uh, Martin Palmer laid the emphasis on the fact that uh, we also have to uh, use our heart and our emotions to try and convince people with our heart and not just with talk to their wisdom. But I think that uh, an institutional declaration could also yield some very good results. If this declaration were to be adopted, then action will become possible, especially uh, it will become possible to combine the efforts made by different players, such as uh, various states and governments, institutions, national or international civil society organizations, uh, religious associations, schools. Uh, they will all unite to defend a unique cause and to achieve the same results. I would therefore like to suggest that we initiate a process uh, after having defined objectives and distributed the roles that each player will play and after also having set up a number of mechanisms to measure our progress. If we were to uh, launch such a strong initiative for our future and the future of all the other living species by involving different types of players uh, acting in different ways, we may be able to uh, appease tensions uh, which are rising in our communities. Nous allons réussir à dissiper des tensions internes entre. And maybe this will allow us to um, mitigate uh, tensions which are building up uh, between various communities. Professor, thank you so much for that suggestion, which. Nicholas, I think we have to think seriously about this. This is a new challenge, a new suggestion. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you also, Professor, for giving us such a sense of the urgency of your, com your call. It gives me great uh, pleasure to introduce Professor Tu Wai Ming, who has become a very good friend indeed. He is a professor of philosophy and a pillar of the neo-Confucianist movement, not just in China, but worldwide. He interprets Confucianist ethics as a spiritual resource for the emerging global community. In 2001, he was appointed by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan as a member of the UN group of eminent persons to facilitate the dialogue amongst civilizations. He is the founder and president of the International Confucianist Ecological Alliance. And we are delighted to welcome you, sir. Uh, respected uh, fellow participants at this uh, unique summit on conscience. Why should we care? Simply put, the viability of the human species is at stake. Is uh, spiritual humanism a viable option to a new way of thinking, a new cosmology, and even a new ethos? In our modern age, secular humanism has become the dominant ideology. It is so prevalent that it now overshadows virtually all religious persuasions. For almost a century, the intellectual ethos in China has been overwhelmed by materialism and instrumental rationality. Even now, it is characterized by economism and consumerism with profound negative impact on the environment. But the pivotal change is in the offing. We are desperately in need of formulating effective critiques of the hubris of modernity, such as aggressive anthropocentrism and possessive individualism, by advocating the unity of heaven and humanity a sense of reverence toward heaven, respect and care for earth, and peace all under heaven. Spiritual humanism underscores humanity through dialogue and 
reconciliation in order to develop a sense of harmony. The opposite of harmony is uniformity. But a precondition for harmony is the recognition and celebration of difference, notably cultural diversity. The emergence of an ecumenical and cosmopolitan consciousness encourages all organized religions when confronting the dual challenges of ecological degradation and dysfunctional world order to cultivate, in addition to their particular religious languages, the language of humanism for global citizenship. We choose to be Christian, Buddhist, or Muslim, but inevitably we are human as well. And we are obligated by the current state of the world to be responsible for cultivating a sustainable relationship with the earth. Spiritual humanism can help to deepen the intellectual and moral depth of our environmental awareness. In order to change the ethos of international politics, we must engage in dialogues on core values across cultures. Universal values currently recognized, such as liberty, rationality, legality, human rights, and the dignity of the individual, can and should be fruitfully compared and substantially enriched by other universal values embodied in virtually all cultures past and present, notably rightness, justice, or fairness, civility, responsibility, and social solidarity. For spiritual humanism, the focus is on commiseration, sympathy, empathy, compassion, and of course, care. An important spiritual exercise in this connection is to extend our own sympathetic feelings to those uh, others, not only our family, that eventually they encompass an ever-expanding network of human and non-human relatedness. The ideal is to form a unity, a body with heaven, earth, and a myriad things. The great advances in communications and information technologies have substantially enhanced the human capacity to learn, to relearn, and to unlearn. Space and time have collapsed into a new reality, enabling us immediate access to data, information, and knowledge about heaven above, earth below, and all things in between. This also profoundly helps us, provides us with a great opportunity to enlarge the scope and refine the quality of our conscience. Let me quote the opening lines of the Western inscription of the 11th century Confucian thinker, Zhang Zai. Heaven is my father and earth is my mother. Even such a tiny creature as I finds intimacy in their midst. All that fills the universe is my body and all that directs the universe is my nature. All people are my brothers and sisters and all things are my companions." End of quote. This requires that we embrace and respect nature as an integral part of our communion. Another defining characteristic of spiritual humanism is the awareness that we ought to show reverence for heaven. Heaven is uh, omnipresent and omnip omniscient, but not necessarily omnipotent. We are obligated to assist in the transforming and nourishing process of heaven and earth. In so doing, we can form a trinity with heaven and earth. Religionists can take the authentic spiritual humanistic stance without in any way losing their primary identities with their own faith communities. Indeed, increasingly, there's a group of believers who are willing and happy to call themselves in this sense, humanists who care for the earth as an ultimate commitment. The term humanist here embraces true cosmopolitanism that is spiritual as well as natural. As a comprehensive and integrated humanism, four dimensions of the commonly shared human experience, self, community, earth, and heaven, are brought together to define the highest manifestation of human flourishing. First, integration of the body, heart, mind, soul, and spirit of the self. Second, 
fruitful interaction of self and society from the family to the global community as a whole. Three, sustainable and harmonious relationship with the human, uh, uh, between the human species and nature, the animal kingdom, plants, trees, rocks, mountains, rivers, and air. And four, mutuality, mutual responsiveness between the human heart and mind and the weight of heaven. China is at a crossroads. It must pursue its own exceptionally unique path, but its path cannot be exclusively Chinese. China should live up to its own cultural ideal to be cosmopolitan and spiritually humanistic. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, professeur. Et on sait combien la, le poids de la Chine est important dans les futures négociations pour la COP. Thank you, professor. We know that China is going to be very important for the future negotiations during COP 21. Marina Silva. Marina Silva is a senator in Brazil. She's famous in France. We followed her campaign during the presidential elections. She got 20% of the vote. She has massively contributed to. Uh, Brazil reforestation when she was a minister under Lula. In five years, she slowed down by 45%, the, uh, cut down by 45% the surface of forest that was supposed to be cut down. Por que devemos nos preocupar? Por quando devo nos sucir? Devemos nos preocupar. concern ourselves with what is happening right under our eyes and which is beginning to become dramatic if we do nothing and there is a profound process of uh, catastrophic change due to a number of political cultural and economic uh, uh, disturbances again due to climate change costs may be gigantic for the most vulnerable among us So we must, of course, concern ourselves with this because the majority of compromises considered for COP21 are far from what is actually necessary. We must thus concern ourselves with all this because among the main countries of the world and up until now, up until now, only a few, in particular the European Union, have attempted to make, put in place compromises which are in compliance with this complex problem. thus concern ourselves with this because the countries with the greatest um, responsibility for emissions in the world have not yet shown themselves to be capable of creating the conditions to contribute to co-action in terms of decarbonizing the world. And this is, of course, um, difficult in terms of countries which remain too conservative or 
move forward too slowly in terms of the trajectory of change. So we must also concern ourselves with this because the fundamental questions for the transition, which of course involve seeking for a sustainable development model, have not yet been solved. For example, the creation of some kind of safe mechanism to avoid uh, outsourcing of um, countries intensive in production of CO2 from one country to another. Thus, we must also be concerned because there's no effective and decisive conviction unless all countries with a high and mid-revenue must, of course, agree to ag reduce their carbon emissions. All countries with low revenue must also be willing to agree with a number of significant objectives of reduction in line with their reality. And third, all the different uh, populations in countries with a high and mid-level of revenue must also offer p or pay their share in terms of the collective and individual effort, which is at the basis of these intensive models in terms of carbon consumption. And all countries must also completely eliminate all sorts of uh, incentives to consume fossil fuels and consider low carbon emission energies. Only the high revenue countries must financially and technologically aid countries with low revenue in this transition. Thus, we must also concern ourselves with this because the people in the compromised communities, both ethically and spiritually, and in terms of human, who are philosophical and artistic reflexes, have not yet assumed a sufficient uh, responsibility for the changes in the climate, which will have a profound impact in society. We must also concern ourselves with this because before us, because what we see before us is a dramatic choice, which is win or lose, which can destroy a culture, life, and uh, lifestyles in general, and also the essential parts of our planet and our civilization. We must also concern ourselves with this because this serious, severe crisis of civilizations, which involves 
all the different aspects, economic, political, environmental, social aspects, the, this can be uh, the heritage that we will leave for the future generations, which would break the relations of solidarity and love that we must maintain between just generations. So we must again concern ourselves urgently and with these this ethical imperative which lies before us in order to connect to connect what we say what, and what we do, ethics and politics, and principles and actions. Change in tradition, economics and ecology, art and science, word and acts, reality with mystery, the sky and the earth. Thank you so much. No. Extraordinarily powerful presentation again. We're moving now uh, seamlessly into our first plenary, the theme of which is Why Do I Care? The fight against climate change, a personal issue, and a universal challenge. And before we start, it is uh, with great pleasure that I invite uh, the Venerable uh, Chang Ji and the Venerable Chang Zhao from the Dharma Drum Mountain Buddhist Center in Taiwan to lead us in a moment of meditational chant. Just there. Yeah. Just a quick explanation of what this chant we do daily. Um, we vow to serve and care for all sentient beings through the transcendence of our limitations and fears. Utilizing skillful means for self-transformation, we realize humanity's potential. You may close your eyes if you want to enjoy the great vows in your inner voice. So
是。I think it would be difficult to find anything that could make the transition from one session to another more beautiful than that. Thank you very much indeed, Venerable. We come to our first session, our first plenary, and the mood shifts here because we are asking our keynote speakers to take us on a journey, starting with the why do I care, and then what do I do, and then what should I do more, and then how can we spread this to the world? We've asked our keynote speakers to speak for just six minutes each, uh, and then we will have two panels, two groups of three, who will meet down here for brief presentations of three minutes and then discussion, and either myself or Isabel will play the role of quiz master, or of examiner, if you like. And so uh, it is a great pleasure to ask uh, Professor Mohammed Yunus to come and speak first. Um, he is well known, I'm sure, to many of you for having founded the Grameen Bank and for his extraordinary work in helping to lift the poorest and the most disadvantaged out of poverty through economics, but in economics the world didn't really recognize before. Professor, we are delighted to have you. Thank you very much. Well, the question raised here is, uh, why do I care? And my answer is, I care because if I don't, it will be all over. And I refuse to accept that outcome. So I resist that outcome. That's why I care. Uh, the present civilization has been built on a basic premise that uh, human beings are all profit makers. Uh, the world has been done as a profit-centric world. It's a, everybody's chasing money. Uh, that's all the core value of the present civilization. I think that has uh, been done on a distortion of a human being, a misinterpretation of a human being in this current civilization. Uh, human beings are not money-making robots. They are not created to chase money or get addicted to money. So that's a basic flaw in the whole system. And to let that system continue as business as usual uh, is not an option. We cannot let this uh, irreversible process of self-destruction to continue. So that's the basic issue that we have to raise uh, around everything that we have been discussing here. Uh, how to make that irre irreversible process become reversed so that we can rediscover ourselves as a human being. Uh, human beings are not just a one-dimensional being. That all they do in their lifetime is make money and that's a success, that's what uh, takes it to the next level. So we discovered that we are multidimensional beings. We are selfish as well as we are selfless. Our selflessness has to express itself in the business world, in the world that we live in. And that's the direction that we have to move. So the current civilization, which is uh, uh, leading us to the self-destruction, we have to get out of this current civilization, move to a new civilization. That's what the, behind all these issues that we have been discussing. Even if you can, for the time being, protect the world, that will not be a permanent solution to the problem because until we re redesign the civilization, we will fall into the same trap again. So instead of doing that, we create a new civilization where we want to proceed in a different way. Uh, we have been creating businesses to solve problems, not for making money. Uh, that's the business we call our, them as a social business, non-dividend company to solve human problems. And it works. It's, uh, otherwise, it's all left to the charity to do address all the problems. One of the issues that I've been underlining, charity is a wonderful idea, but it has a limitation. 
The limitation is charity money goes out, does the work, but it doesn't come back. So you have only one time use of the money. But if you do the same objective, address the same objective, put behind a business engine behind it, then it becomes a different kind of uh, entity. We call it social business. Here we're doing it not for making money, but to solve the problem and get the money back. So then the social business money becomes uh, recyclable money, uh, unlimited use for the money, continue to do that. So we have been doing that again and again. And that's the idea that you put in as a beginning of the new civilization where human beings not only will be making money, also create creatively businesses to solve human problems in that. So in, in, as a kind of, kind of precondition for the new civilization, I put a target or a goal of achieving three zeros as a transition point in the new civilization. Zero number one, creating a world without poverty. It's a feasible. It's already been demonstrated uh, through the MDG goals and so on. Now there's DG goals. We'll repeat that to bring it to zero. So it's a doable thing to bring poverty to zero. Next zero, zero unemployment. And I keep insisting unemployment is an artificially created uh, phenomenon. It's not a basic thing in human beings. Human beings are not born to work for somebody else. But somehow in this civilization we are told you have to go through the education process, get a piece of paper, the certificate, and go in the job market, get a job. I think that's a humiliating thing for a human being to go out to find a job. Human beings are much bigger than that. Human beings are go-getters. They are creators. They create things, not just to start at the very bottom doing tiny things where at the peak of your creative capacity. So the second zero is a zero unemployment. It's a doable thing. We have been doing that, creating opportunities for young people to become entrepreneurs. It's not a rocket science to do that. It's a very simple few steps that you can convert every human being, every young person, into entrepreneurs. I tell them that uh, re believe in yourself, tell yourself that we are not job seekers, we are job creators, and go for that. So the second one, the third one, zero net emission. That's the one that we are discussing here. So when we fulfill this, we fulfill the condition of creating a new civilization. That's the direction that we have to get. get. And we have to involve everything that we do in this planet within that framework. Uh, we have to repeatedly shout out that we are human beings, we are not robots. We will live like human beings. Thank you very much. Nous ne sommes pas des robots. Merci beaucoup. J'appelle maintenant la tribune le père Rigobert. I would like to call on Father Rigobert Binana Bihuzo, who comes from the Congo, but who is currently living in Kenya. He is a Jesuit a founder of the Jeremy Group, which works in terms of raising awareness among populations as to peace issues, but also climate issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Donc, why do I care and why should we worry? Well. The debate on climate change has been confiscated over the last few years by experts at the service of private interests and governments. And they approach the question in such a way that we mask the difficulties of taking seriously the danger that uh, climate, uh, global warming is uh, giving the planet. It is also a question of the human beings who are victims of the phenomena, this is to say the, the poor. And the consequences, the forecastable con consequences are in fact thoroughly documented and they re demand uh, mobilization on the part of all, especially when it comes to human resources but also spiritual resources. This is why we are here today because we need to go as far as we can and, of, and no longer be in agreement with an approach which does not take into account the human. Today we have a major challenge and the question is urgent and the moment is grave. No one can remain indifferent. Pope Francis 
has uh, discussed this question on conscious conscience when he refers to the resistance we see in certain international negotiations. We've heard this in Paris as well. We've heard that people who place their international their national interests above the interests of the common goose will have to answer for it, to answer for those who suffer from the consequences in the future. So you will thus understand that since I come from Africa, I am trying to bring you back to where you began, because humanity was born in Africa. And I would like to also give my voice to give a voice to the millions of inaudible voices which will be affected tomorrow because unfortunately they have been relegated to the periphery of a debate which of course is uh, involves them in every respect. So in, as we await for the COP21 in summit, we are mobilizing both as a church and in civil society and among the population. We are mobilizing in order to ask for three things. First is that we must need mandatory measures and, cons and considering a consensus, clearly this will be difficult. At least governments, however, will have a difficulty with this. So the second aspect is to have a differentiated approach. That is to say, Af Africa should not pay the price of those who have been polluting the world for the last hundred years. And third, we need political and legal mechanisms which will be mandatory for all. Now, I would thus like to suggest two actions. First, the, in order to save forests in the Congo Basin, and I would like to give you six reasons why this is important. We cannot win this fight for of global warming if we do not focus or zoom into what everybody today is calling the second lung of humanity. This area today and is, first of all, the place where 80 million people live. And it is also the second largest forest next to Amazoni, the Amazon, and one of the biggest, and this is one of the major tropical forests on the planet. We have 10,000 species of plants and many other species of animals and mammals. It is essential to save humanity because humanity is generating the oxygen that we all breathe, as do the animals. So this is playing an irreplaceable role because this is the place where climate is regulated. Most of precipitation in Africa is generated right there. And it determines the slowing of global warming because it stores carbon. And finally, and this is not the least of our issues, it also provides food for millions of people and a pharmacopoeia for our populations. And of course, drinkable water as well. So I would like to conclude because I can see that our time uh, master is right next to me here. Let me talk about water here. Because as we well know, today, we are paying for a com well, we have a fight for the control of water. And thus it is important as well to recall that we cannot f fight against climate change if we do not look at the dangers that threaten populations which do not have access to drinkable water. And my continent is in that situation. So thus, in order to conclude, I would like to quote the Pope once again by saying, with respect to water, that the this particularly serious problem is the quality of water available to the poor, which basically is a leading to illnesses. Illnesses due to poor water are very common among the poor, and it is basically also a cause of suffering and infant mortality. So the quality of available water has an increasing tendency in certain areas of being privatized. This resource is being privatized and transformed into a commodity, depriving the poor. Thank you very much. We now come to the slightly unusual part of our morning, 
and indeed of each of these sessions. We will have two panels. We're just having the uh, uh, lectern replaced and we're going to ask uh, in groups of three, uh, three people to come and tell us why they care. We've asked them to give three minutes, which uh, I do a lot of work for the BBC. Three minutes is what you're given to sort of introduce yourself on the radio and outline your main point. And then we will ask them to debate amongst themselves. I will uh, play a small role in uh, asking questions and asking them to engage with each other. And for our first three, um, I would be delighted if uh, Sheikh Abdul Al Tamimi would come forward, uh, if Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Nanda, uh, Nandita Krishna would join us, and um, if uh, Albert Tevoedra would come and join us as well. Uh, the Sheikh, please come up all of you onto the dais, um, come up all of you here. Sheikh, you'll be speaking first, so if you would go to the lectern first, Nandita, and then Albert here. Um, the Sheikh is a writer. He is committed to the education of women and younger generations for social justice and interfaith dialogue. He's the founder of the Center for Racial, Religious, and Cultural Diversity in Iraq. And he joins us from Baghdad. Nandita Krishna is a scholar, historian, environmentalist, and writer living in Chennai. She is director of the C.P. Ramaswamy uh, Ira Foundation and founding director of the CPR Environmental Education Center. She has pioneered the documentation of the ecological traditions of India and restored more than 50 sacred groves in India. And Albert Tevohedera is a former prime minister of Benin. We are honored to have you all here. Um, Sheikh, if you would start with your three minute description of why you care. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa tini wa zaytuni wa turi sinin wa hadha al-balad al- In the name of God, the merciful, and it's a verse from the surah from the end of the Quran, surah atin, that is to say, a surah that describes the fruits and figs and olives, and Mount Sinai. I wanted to quote the Surah of the Quran because my country, Iraq, is a country which previously was a very rich country in natural resources and was moving forward in terms of development. It was uh, also rich in palms, trees, and among other resources, we had dates. We also had a number of types of uh, migratory birds in my country and also considerable wealth in terms of the wetlands in the south of the country. This is why in Mesopotamia, between the Tigris and the Euphrates, many civilizations were born, especially the Babylonian, Sumerian, and other civilizations, and also many religions, the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, as well as other older religions, such as that of the Sabaeans.
So I'm very sad to have to say today that the situation has completely changed since the end of the second millennium and even prior to that. We saw the diversity of Iraq suffering greatly. Different religions and different cultures suffered a great deal. There was a true hemorrhaging of a number of populations who were forced to emigrate and especially Jewish populations at the beginning of the 40s who had to leave Baghdad. Then it was the turn of the Christians and today it is Yazidik who are being massacred in my country. Thus, there is practically no further cultural diversity that existed previously and so I could probably say that there is a kind of a single culture now, a uniform culture if I may so put it, in my country. This is an unfortunate coincidence, but with the departure of all these essential parts of Iraqi society, now we are seeing an increase in pollution. We can see that the two major problems of Iraq, of uh, our two major rivers, our historical rivers, are drying up. And believe it or not, we are now forced to import dates, which were one of the major natural agricultural researchers, the resources of our country in the past. This is why, dear friends, I am very concerned with the climate change phenomena, and I would also like to call upon you to be solidar to be supportive of Mesopotamia and Iraq. Thank you. I wrote it down, Martin, so that you don't have to tell me to uh, cut short my time. Why do I care? I was brought up in a Hindu religious tradition which regards nature and all her aspects as divine. Forests, mountains, trees, rivers and water bodies, animals and seeds are all regarded as sacred. The earth is the divine mother who must be treated with respect. The five elements which we call Panchabhuta, earth, air, water, fire, fire or energy, and space, are the foundation of the interconnected web of life. Every prayer, every ritual begins and ends with a prayer for peace in nature. Our environmental actions affect our karma, binding all creation in an eternal cycle of birth, death and rebirth. Dharma which is righteousness or duty, includes our responsibility to care for the earth and her resources. As a child, I frequently lived around forests where tigers, leopards, elephants, deer, and a whole lot of wildlife crossed my path. Gradually, the forests were cut down and the wildlife disappeared. Meanwhile, my city of Chennai which was famous for its temples and temple bells and classical music and dance, became a hotbed of air and water pollution, pollution and of course garbage. Today, what do we see? All over the world, we see animals and birds kept in cages and treated as production machines. Is this ethical? Is this sustainable? Are we doing the right thing to our fellow creation? After all, they too were created to live on this earth like we are. An insatiable greed for wealth and unlimited consumption has gripped all people on this earth, and that is at the cost of the environment. This has led to the crisis of global warming and climate change. I have spent over three decades writing about sacred groves, plants, animals, and so on, and I've restored over 50 sacred forests, 52 actually, and water bodies. And when we restored them, we found that the animals came back, the birds came back, and they were so happy. It was magical. So every, every, all, all creation wants 
what the earth was created to do and to be. Ahimsa or non-violence is the greatest dharma and it starts with simple and sustainable lifestyles. Each one of us must make an individual commitment to live sustainably and change our lifestyles. Mahatma Gandhi said, Earth provides enough to satisfy every man's need, but not for every man's greed. He also said, be the change that you wish to see in the world. Instead of our talking about somebody else changing, we have to change. These are two excellent dicta that can say, save the world. Finally, I'd like to just read a translation of the Shanti Mantra, the Peace Mantra, that we say before and after every uh, ritual, every prayer, every function, anything. We say, O oh Supreme Lord, may there be peace in the sky and in space. May there be peace on land and in the waters. May herbs and vegetation bring peace. May all personifications of God, all creations of God bring us peace. May the Lord bring us peace and may there be pre peace throughout the world. May the Lord give me such peace also. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Thank you. Merci. Merci. Je viens à vous comme un Thank you. I am an African man who's been lucky in his life. While others did not attend school, I was lucky. I was noticed and they sent me to a small school and everything changed. I'm lucky because this school took me out of my country across the world. And today, at my age, I'm 86, I have just recently noticed that, that I'm going to leave this world with worries because during my life there have been events. I remember meeting Ivan Ilyich and he asked me to write my book, Poverty and Wealth of People, and also by the European Club. And at the time they had started an idea for an, in, an initiative to lead the growth and I actually participated in this exchange of ideas regarding wealth. And earlier we were talking about profit at all costs. And this is something that I witness every day in everything we do with the environment. We ruin the earth, we ruin the forest, we ruin the sea, we ruin, we devastate absolutely everything. And this is the reason why I would like to say that I am worried, I am concerned. As someone said earlier, Kofi and Jan said, Oh, no, sorry, Professor Filali, when we talk about the Declaration of Human Rights, we should talk about the Declaration of Human Duties. I agree with that. I'll give you an example. Article 13 in the Declaration of Human Rights. As world citizens, we should be free to uh, travel everywhere where we want. And we see what happens with migrating populations, refugees. So back to the uh, heart of the matter. I would like to uh, commend all those, congratulate all those who have organized, helped organize this uh, Summit of Conscience because this is opening a new way. On all topics now, there will be the possibility for us to organize a Summit of Conscience to ask ourselves the right question, understand where we're going. What was said previously by my colleague regarding the African forest is something extremely serious because forest for us is sacred. We have fetish trees, we talk to the forest, we go to the forest, we sit down and we organize palaver. And if we destroy the forest, how are we going to do this? And how, we can, uh, how can we get the right level of energy to uh, rescue, save the forest, the forest uh, which uh, is a harbor for us and, and, and the heaven protecting us, a place where we can straighten ourselves as Africans and as human beings. I would like to remind you that if we came here today to this uh, summit, we came to France, Victor Hugo's uh, country, where we uh, are observed by Cain's eyes. And I remember Abbe Pierre, uh, and he used to say, 
the story of man individually and collectively is a uh, sequel of uh, a chain of uh, long disciplined periods and sudden undisciplined periods. And the long disciplined periods are, placed, are based on conscience. So I would like to say no and just no derives from conscience. Thank you. Thank you all three very much indeed. I want to ask you to pick up on something that seems to be a common thread in what you've said, and particularly following up on uh, Mr. Tevo Ederan's uh, comments at the end. In your sense of protecting and, and loving your natural environment, how central is it that it itself is considered sacred? How central is it? Nandita, you want to start with that and then perhaps pass to... I, I think uh, it is sacred. And the reason I say it is sacred is because we cannot replicate it. We cannot create water. We cannot create trees. We can plant a seed, but then the whole tree is something we can't create. So it's created by a divine hand. So it has to be more sacred. And so I think, you know, the, the fact that the environment is sacred is very important in the work I do. And also, I work a lot about animal welfare and animal rights. And I feel that the way we are treating animals is disgusting and awful because, um, you know, they are transported across the world. They are confined in uh, factory farms and so on. So I think unless we see the divinity in all creation, we will never understand that what is our role and what is our duty. Sheikh, I know that within Islam, this is a complex topic, but could you respond to that notion of the sacred within nature as well as beyond? Islam <laughs> والديانات الإبراهيمية نعتبر أن المياه والتراب هي العناصر الأساسية لطهارة الإنسان والإنسان فيما لو تنجس جسده لا يطهره إلا الماء والتراب En ce qui concerne l'islam et je pense que cela as far as Islam is concerned, and I think this is also whole true, holds true for all other Abraham religions, water and the earth are the essential elements, uh, giving a man its purity. And if the if man's uh, soul and body are soiled, then water and the earth will purify them. Man washes with water, and once man is dead, he goes back to uh, earth in the form of dust. Merci. Je viens I just recently uh, organized a symposium in Benin, I was very lucky, regarding the African initiative uh, for education to peace and development through intercultural, interreligious dialogue. And we heard a uh, Senegalese speaker, Garun Diop, who said something rather extraordinary. He said, and I quote, first, I rest my gaze on other people, and other people's dignity is the basis for the changes that we are wishing for. If you look at somebody walking by in the street, maybe a peddler or a beggar, somebody sweeping the street or working in an office or a man driving a, a car, each one of them is a temple for God. Each one of them was created to resemble God. And so you have to change the way you look at those people. You become somebody who contributes to humankind with your own creation. And nature, which is your home, was lent to you as a place to live. And it's also the home of the other people. So you have to change the way you look at nature as well. This panel, and I think the 
As you can see, what we're trying to do is to have much more of a discussion. We have a second panel coming now. After that panel, we're going to ask you to turn to the person next to you, and if you've, in a very British kind of way, left a lot of space between you and the next person so that you're not too close, well, you're going to have to be much more French and get closer. Okay, because we're going to ask you to talk for a couple of minutes with the person beside you about the issues that have been raised in the panels. So perhaps you would want to discuss about this notion of the sacred and see what comes out of our second panel and then we will finish. But can we give a huge thanks to our first three panelists. Merci, Martin. J'appelle donc la seconde table ronde. Thank you, Martin. Uh, second uh, panel, André Riccardi. Uh, Mrs. Bandana Shiva, Mr. Chuan. Same uh, exercise. For a couple of minutes, each of you will try and explain why they care, and then there will be a short discussion. Mr. Riccardi. Alors, Monsieur Riccardi, vous êtes fondateur de Santé Gidio. Monsieur Riccardi, you're the founder of Santé Gidio, an Italian community very famous for the work conducted with uh, Pope's uh, John Paul II, Bene Benedictus, and now Pope Francesco. So Francis, and you talk, your community works on the environment. Well, thank you. You can't make the world over in three minutes, but you can say something. <coughs> I would like to talk about religion. Three things. The fact that we neglected the humanistic and spiritual aspect in the ecological matters made us uh, interpret environment in a very sectorial way. As my friend Rosen said, the uh, climate crisis is both a uh, something catastrophic but also an opportunity. There is a joint atmosphere across the planet, but uh, religions talk about heaven. Are religions capable of talking about heaven, in heaven, about the uh, atmosphere and humanity because I believe that the two most important subjects are peace and ecology. On peace we have made progress but on ecology religions will certainly refer to themselves <coughs> as if they were islands and not sailing common waters. So let me quote what uh, Rumi, the Muslim Prophet said, only with your heart would you touch heaven. We must dig into our depths to find the real motivations to teach, found a, an ecological conversion. Secondly, religions look up to heaven, but they also listen to the shouts and cries from the population, painful cries coming from the southern hemisphere. And uh, we have uh, people who have not been acknowledged as being refugees, but they are refugees because of climate <coughs> reasons. Even in northern countries, there are people suffering from uh, global warming. Elderly people or handicapped people have suffered from um, heat waves. Global warming is uh, affecting uh, isolated and elderly people because solitude is an additional aspect of poverty. Third, and I have not made the world over, ma'am, religious leaders are discouraged in their traditional vision when confronting uh, scientific, ecological, political, economic problems. Of course, it is complex. There are technical, political, scientific aspects, but there is also inherent simplicity. We must rescue ourselves together. 
No country is an island. No country can rescue itself alone. Never before was the destiny of the planet so united. Karina so reminded us earlier that uh, Earth was our common house. And uh, global warming is affecting the whole planet. Religions have always talked about um, the fact that the whole human, whole human kind will be rescued together. So we must go beyond <coughs> political divides and the policies uh, implemented in a very fragmented way by government. We have to go towards a world governance. This is something written in the spirit, and not only in political motivations. And I'm getting there. But this time it's very interesting. People call you, you hurry, and then when you are there, they say you should uh, make haste. I think we can do something. I can we can get there in the gospel it says everything can be done by he who has faith and here we have a function for religions educating to a new spiritual model as Mahatma Gandhi said and after having quoted Mahatma Gandhi I would like to quote again I am dog I am God's server and I would like to serve all of creation I cannot serve God only and mankind without serving the whole creation thank you <laughs> Mrs. Vandana Shiva comes from India. She's very famous in uh, India as an uh, after environmental activist. You're also a university uh, professor and you're fighting to defend uh, biodiversity and the right of uh, farmers, the rights of farmers, because you believe that they go together. Because caring is what makes us human. Our compassion is the true test of our humanity, not conquest, not violence, not accumulation, not extermination. And while there's a lot of talk about people dying in the future, in our parts of the world, people are dying today. 30,000 died, 1999, super cyclone in Orissa. Two years ago in my region in the Himalaya, 20,000 people were washed out or buried under landslides with intense rain and flooding. In the desert of Ladakh, 200 people washed away in 2010. And this spring, as we were ready to harvest and celebrate our harvest festival, we had hailstorms and rain that destroyed 50% of the crop of North India. 200 farmers either committed suicide or died of shock when they went to the field in the Ganges Basin where the Ganges has never failed them, but climate change is making them insecure. But there's another aspect of climate change which is more slow, more invisible, but has huge consequences even today. And this is the extreme events that aren't flooding, but are droughts. It's the drought of 20, 2009 that erupted the instability and violence in Syria. Syria was not part of the Arab Spring. There was no rebellion in Syria before that. A million peasants got displaced, 80% of the crop was wiped out, 80% of the livestock. That displacement triggered all the other problems and now we don't even know how many problems there are, um, except those who are war mongers would like to use every place as an excuse for war. Or even Boko Haram. Lake Chad, 23,000 kilometers in the 60s, supported 9 million people till recently, shrunk to less than 5% in 2001. My guess is 2015, less than 1%. Livestock, herders, farmers, fishermen displaced. It's that displacement that is leading to conflict. And that conflict is ecological in its roots. It's a repercussion of our war against the earth. And yet, it's always named as a religious conflict, and violence is essentialized to religion when it is not essential to religion. Peace is what is essential to religion. But I also care as a scientist. 
I deliberately trained, you're already here? Okay, I deliberately trained to be a quantum physicist. I just want to touch on the two symbols here. That butterfly is connected to our survival. We are spraying poisons in Roundup, and we've killed 90% of the monarchs, 75% of the bees, thinking we can continue to spray more Roundup and get food, but even more important, that lovely leaf that is the symbol of COP. And this I will finish, even while you're standing there. Because it's that leaf that is the answer to our survival. Because in it is the miracle of the sun, the chlorophyll, the photosynthesis, carbon being pulled out of the air, put into the soil. I really feel we should stop using the term decarbonization. What we need is more living carbon in plants, in trees, in wetlands, in the soil. The soil can pull out, as the president said this morning, 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent if we do organic farming. And this is my dream as an Earth citizen. Nicholas, if you follow up this wonderful meeting of diversity you have called with everyone that comes to COP to make a commitment to plant a garden here. There were tropical gardens created through accumulating plants from the colonies. Today, if we plant a garden of hope, of diversity, of peace, when we are here in Paris in December, and bring to reality his Holy Father's beautiful statement, we receive the garden as our home. Don't leave it as a desert. Un autre micro, un autre astrophysicien euh, qui nous expliquait hier. Un autre astrophysiciste, M. Trinh Chuan Chuan, qui a dit hier que l'Earth est la seule planète où il y a une conscience et que nous allons probablement devenir comme Vénus où il n'y a pas de conscience. Oui, je vais parler de pourquoi je m'en prie sous l'angle de l'astrophysiciste. Our Earth is unique. We need to rescue our Earth. It is the only in our solar system where there is any sign of life, especially intelligent life. We have tried to find signs of life in other planets, possibly microorganisms, uh, but not even microorganisms are living on any planet. <clears throat> I do not believe in the fact that people say, oh, well, if the Earth uh, is in too bad shape, we'll move to Mars. I don't believe in this. Take Mercury, for instance, uh, which is the closest to the sun. The uh, temperature on the surface is 430 degrees. No life may develop on Mercury. And then there is Venus, and uh, Venus is even hotter than that, for 450 uh, degrees, four times the temperature of boiling water. So if it's further away from the sun, why is it uh, hotter? Because of uh, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, the uh, greenhouse effect. The uh, atmosphere on Venus is 96% uh, CO2, and Venus is not that far away from the Earth. 0.25 uh, astronomic units, uh, that is the distance between the Earth and the, and, uh, the sun. So you see the distance. Uh, that makes a difference. Uh, on Venus, all water has evaporated. This is not a blue planet like ours. And uh, carbon dioxide has accumulated in the atmosphere, 96% CO2, a huge greenhouse effect, no life whatsoever, any form of life. And our Earth, and then Mars, Mars, 96% CO2. The atmosphere is uh, 10,000 times uh, less thick than on Venus, but still, no life, no water. <clears throat> there was water, apparently, some billion years ago, a few billion years ago, but there is no water now on Mars, so it's not possible to live there. So it's not realistic to think that we will ever live on Mars. And then there are four more planets, gaseous planets, Saturn, Uranus, uh, and uh, some planets with no uh, solid surface, so no life again. 
some people tried to find life on Mars uh, because there were signs that had there had been water at some stage. No result. Maybe on cool down moons we can find something uh, like Europe, uh, Jupiter's um, moon, because we think that there may be a liquid uh, ocean under a layer of ice. But again, nobody could live there. So that's the first reason why. I'm warning you against thinking of living on Mars. And also because we're talking about conscience, conscience awareness is something that is very diffi is difficult to uh, create in any universe. We have a very specific universe. We are all coming from uh, stardust. If there were no stars, we wouldn't be here. But uh, it, it was necessary to have a certain type of physical laws and constants before we were created. And, uh, you know, 60 figures behind the the, uh, the dot, and this is the degree of accurate accuracy uh, for uh, a star's formation. No heavy metals or elements, no stars, uh, no heavy metals, no conscience. So please do not self-destruct. We play an essential role. We give a meaning to the universe. The universe is not empty. We were created by the universe. And if we self-destruct, if we destruct our beautiful planet, we'll create a nonsense in the universe. Thank you very much for this trip through the planet across the sky. I'd like uh, to uh, highlight something that was said by Mrs. Shiva, compassion. You talked about compassion. You said how compassion was important. You mentioned compassion. You said that compassion was important. Is this something on which religions will unite? Well, compassion can be found everywhere in all religious traditions. Now, the main issue is the heart. Christianism, uh, the Jewish religion uh, are asking, are raising the question. We live in a period where we no longer live with our heart. What does it mean to wake up the heart? In the biblical tradition, the heart is not a physical organ. It is something that makes human life different from other fa other forms of human of um, lives, and that unites man with God. The main mission for religions uh, in uh, urban communities and uh, human communities that have lost their soul consists in waking up the heart. And when the heart wakes up, then you start seeing. You start seeing other people, and you start seeing creation. That is the main issue. We are blind. We are like blind people. We are scattered across the reality, looking for our own individual destiny. But on the way, we destroy other people's destiny and the destiny of the future generations. And this is compassion. It's about wisdom of the heart. Mrs. Shiva, what about compassion? Because you're the one who used the word. in a way in which it reflects the fact that there is common passion because we are interconnected, we are not separate. But that also means that a coming alive of the heart is a coming alive of the true human mind, not the reductionist, mechanistic mimic of a mind that is destroying the world, but the true mind that can comprehend and have resonance between the heart, the mind, and the hands. Because I think the thing that's been abolished is not just the heart, our brains have been exiled and our hands have been exiled in a crazy development model that says no one should work, everyone should become unemployed, that's productivity. No one should think, we'll think for you and we'll own your knowledge as intellectual property, my big fight on biopiracy. And of course you shouldn't have a heart. I've had debates with the biotech industry where the biotech industry said we cannot think of ethics and other irrelevant considerations. So we've got a technological edifice which thinks of values as irrelevant. But the only disvalue of greed must rule. So it is really dysfunctional, a phrase that has been used by so many people today. Merci. Monsieur Tuan, c'est à vous que va revenir le So you get the final word. Do you think that religion can play an important role in the protection of the environment and the planet? Yes, I completely agree. As you know, 
the government can help it, of course, but I think ultimately it is at the base that the movement must occur in terms of protection and saving the planet. Thus, it is our in inner changes that are going to bring about this outside change, and I am completely convinced of this, but let me still talk about compassion for a moment. I see this from the point of view of the cosmic history. As you know, we are nothing but stardust, and so we all share the same cosmic genealogy. We all share these atoms which are made by the cosmos and the stars. And so the difference between the rich and poor, for example, is completely artificial. We are all brothers and cousins of the fields and the animals, and we have a responsibility, a universal responsibility to protect the earth and the cosmos. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to suggest that um, we have been talking about feeding the inner person. Uh, now it's time for lunch to feed the other inner person. Uh, we're going to break now, and we will start again at 2 o'clock promptly. But could you, in your discussions now, just perhaps reflect on those two questions, the nature of a sacred planet and the nature of a compassionate response to other human beings, and to other elements of stardust. Thank you very much. We'll see you back here promptly at 2.